Eventide Entertainment presents The Drive-In, hosted by Aaron Lopez. All right, welcome back to another episode of The Drive-In. Uh, we are back after a week off. I am very happy to be back. It was a an uncomfortable week off uh, as far as not being able to get on the air and talk about some movies. Um, but, you know, sometimes life just prevents you from going to see movies, and this past week was one. So I'm very happy to be back in, uh, in your podcast for this week. And uh, this week I have a, another former guest host. Hi. Nick's back from week uh, 12, what? episode 12, Pitch Perfect 3. Has it been that long already? Man. Yeah, and this is this would be episode, I think this is 20. Jeez. This is, this is number 20. Um, so we are, we're back for this, and uh, we went and we saw uh, Love, Simon. Um, it's our review today. This is directed by Greg Berlanti, uh, and starring Nick Robinson as Simon, Catherine Langford as Leah, and you may have seen her if you watch the 13 Reasons Why Netflix series. Um, and then Josh Duhamel and Jessica Garner as mom and dad. Um, there are a couple others that we'll talk about as we get going, but um, those are kind of the bigger names, the ones that you may have seen before or recognize. Um, Nick's been looking forward to this episode for a while. Actually, I think Ooh, it was yeah. during Pitch Perfect yes. 3 we saw the trailer for this. Yes, and I was like, that's going to be my next episode. We're going to go see this because... I want to do it, and it was definitely well worth the wait, and I'm really excited to talk about this movie. This is this was a good one. Um, you know, we, we went into it kind of knowing a little bit of what to expect, um, you know, in some ways, but it was more of how is it going to portray the concept of coming out. Yes. You know, and that's kind of what we'll talk about as one of our bigger questions throughout the uh, the episode. Um, but that was, that was what our anticipation was. It was like, all right, you know, the actors in this is going to be... Um, a, a little bit of a cheesy movie at times. It's you know kind of has that uh, Nicholas Sparks feel at times, but also at the coming of age. Yeah, we, we knew what we were getting, but um, but also there were a lot of unknowns, and um, I'm excited to talk about those. Yes, absolutely. So our trailer rundown for this week, uh, we had seven, and there's only about one or two that I actually want to see. Uh, well, I'll take that back, two or three. Uh, but the the trailers for this week were Spider Man Into the Spider Verse, uh, which is kind of a Stop motion um, animated Spider Man movie. Uh, Life of the Party, Mamma Mia 2, The Miracle Season, Midnight Sun, Isle of Dogs, which comes out next week, and Deadpool 2, um, which didn't seem to fit in with the rest of these. Not but at all. I saw that. It was like... <laughs> that trailer started, and I just kind of sat there and thought to myself, what the hell? Why is this in this movie? But, you know, as the movie went on, it made a little bit more sense, but it was. Yeah, it was one of those moments. Yeah, I saw that, and I'm excited for Deadpool too. I'm I'm pumped that it's, and I'm, I think I'm more excited that Marvel Studios is so nervous about it taking over Avengers Infinity yeah. War that they bumped up Infinity War like two weeks. It's, I remember reading somewhere about Infinity War. I'm mean, and I am not a Marvel person at all, but it's literally in your face everywhere. So, <laughs> I remember seeing something and reading something about it coming out way later and then I see the trailer like last week that it's coming however soon it's coming it's out. It's now like, in wait. late April. Like, yeah, it was, was supposed like, to be wait. early May and they bumped it up. But, I mean... So Deadpool 2 is, is uh, it's gonna get some traction. The first mm-hmm. one was awesome and is really funny and this, this second one doesn't look any different. Um, are there any that you're looking forward to seeing of those though? So, Deadpool 2, obviously. Um, I said it before, Mamma Mia 2, we talked about it during Pitch Perfect mm-hmm. 2, or 3. Um, the only reason I'm going to go see it is because Cher's in it, and <laughs> but and also to kind of see what kind of a train wreck. But the um, what was the dog one? Uh, Isle of Dogs. Isle of Dogs. That the style that that one shot in mm-hmm. is very interesting to me, um, and it looked it looked really cute, really sweet. Have you seen um, Fantastic Mr. Fox? No, it's the same style. It's that like almost claymation. Um, but not quite. It's a stop motion yeah. sort of thing. But they don't try and make it really smooth. They're okay with it being a little choppy because it's just the structure. But um, Wes Anderson again. So if you guys are into Wes Anderson, as I am, uh, <laughs> which actually we're not sure what we're going to do next week. But Isle of, Do- Isle of Dogs is kind of the one I'm hoping to, to do for episode 21. Um, yeah, I... I don't. The Spider-Man one looks interesting to me. Like I like the Spider-Verse storyline, but 
it looks like a Nickelodeon movie. It's like, like you you made the comment to me during the trailer. It should have been something that looks like it could have just come straight to DVD. Yeah, like it doesn't look. It didn't really create any kind of a plot. It just was like there's others that wear the mask. Yeah, woo. And that's that's the whole concept of the Spider Verse. It's like oh, there's more than one Spider Man. Okay, so that's great. So. Um, yeah, Life of the Party looked really funny though. Another Melissa McCarthy movie. Melissa McCarthy is my hero, and I do want to see that movie it looks good. just because she's hilarious. And it, the trailer was really good. I thought it set up the idea of the movie, the plot. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to be really funny and really entertaining. You know, something for her. I always feel like she she's the same character almost in every movie. Almost like there's variations, but it doesn't seem to like. Usually, I get annoyed and frustrated with that and kind of get tired of it. And she makes it manageable. Like there's never yeah. any time where you're like, "Oh, Melissa McCarthy doing this." She does it every it's, time, and she does a very good job with it. Yeah, it's just always that kooky, off kilter um, character. I remember what was the one where she was she was an executive, the boss, the boss. Yeah, so funny, <laughs> absolutely hilarious. Um, you know, not plugging that movie or anything, but just anything that she does, she puts her her little spin on it. Yeah. And like you said, every character is the same, but it's just different enough to be yeah. that funny in that level of comedy. Yeah, and I, I will. I, I think my favorite with her is um, is it Secret Identity or Stop? Identity Thief. Identity Thief? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's that. I love that one. That's what I thought it was because she was that. The way that that trailer started um, looked. The character looked the same. I was like, wait a minute. Is this a sequel to that? How do you make a sequel to that movie? But, yeah. I mean... No, it looks good. It looks real funny. I think this will be a funny one. So, um, Like, we already talked about Mamma Mia 2. The, the Miracle Season and Midnight Sun, these were two that very much fit Love, Simon. As yes. far as, like, all right, uh, Miracle Season, uh, trailer, somebody, one of the girls on a girls volleyball team passes away. And the girls have to still compete in the season. Mm-hmm. They're really bad. And then they start like getting motivated. And then they fight their way all the way to state. And whether or not they win. So really, the whole movie is told in the trailer. Except for the potential of, of if they win state. Correct. The, you know, spoils it that they make it to the state championships or whatever they do in volleyball. But, and then you're just, you kind of, you uh, sit there and you look at it and you're like, I know how this movie's going to gonna go i'll even call that they're not gonna win but yeah, the fact that they thought. get there and they do it for her and they still competed yep there you go that's it doesn't matter if you win or lose it's playing the game mm-hmm. yeah i could tell you right now that's probably how it's gonna end yep and then midnight sun seemed like an interesting concept um but again you had made the comment in the theater that we've seen this before yeah it was very much um a walk to remember all over again a girl with a disease and finds a boy that you know, she falls in love with. They run off and do adorable things together, and it really plugs at the end of the trailer that she—it's um, Bella Thorne, I think—is who mm-hmm, the girl so. is—that um, she doesn't make it because she's a she has a disease where she can't be in any sunlight. So she sleeps all day, goes out all night. She meets a boy. Um, he encourages her to perform her music that she kind of did like like a street musician, and then the trailer kind of ends with her getting to go out into the sun, which kind of is like, okay, if she's has this disease, she's probably not going to make it, so that's like her last thing. So yeah. to me, I was just like, okay, that really spoiled the movie, but it's very, very a walk to remember, very Nicholas Sparks, just all over again. Yep, it just feels like this one belongs on a Valentine's Day release. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it'll be... It'll be here and then gone, um, as many of these movies are. You know, usually, you get your your two or three weeks of people going to see it, but the, it's not gonna gonna it's draw not, a big crowd. No, it's not gonna draw the audience that it thinks it is. All right. Um, okay, so let's move on to our two hour spoiler free summary. Um, it's in, gonna be an interesting one because the there's this, the plot's very simple. So, mm-hmm. um, the a young coming of age gay teenage boy Simon Spear goes through a different kind of Romeo and Juliet story. Simon has a connection with a boy Blue by email, but the only problem is is that Simon has no idea who he's talking to. Uh, Simon must discover who he is talking to, and along the way tries to find himself as well. Really cheesy end tagline. It's very, but... very simple, but. Kind of just, I mean, describes the movie to a T, so I guess that's why they call right. it. So if you have not yet seen Love, Simon, and you are interested in, because we are definitely going to talk about some spoilers. Spoilers! 
Mm-hmm. So we will we are giving you your opportunity to step away, go see it. Um, you know, as far as this week, there's not a whole lot out. Um, by the time this drops, we'll be getting our, our next week. But uh, unless you're going to see Tomb Raider, uh, there's not much out. So if you want to go see Love, Simon, go check it out and then come back and talk to us. All right. So now we have gotten all of those people out of the way, just those that like to hear us talk or have seen the movie and mm-hmm. want to know what we think about it. Um, first reactions, like overall, um, what what did you think before, before we get into some of the details? It So this movie put me through it. Like, I went through it during this movie, but I thought the way that the story was told, I thought it was very, very well done. It was very much, you know, focused on Simon's character growth and what he's going through and, you know, kind of how, um, you know, coming out and accepting the fact that he is gay and telling the world how it affects not only him, but even the people around him. Yeah. So I thought it was it was very respectful in a way because that movie can be could be done very stereotypically uh, and yeah. very almost derogatory, almost like they're taking advantage of the situation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I so that. I personally I really enjoyed it. It really I have a obviously have a very strong connection with this subject matter because I've been through it and I've done it and it really it brought me back to um, that process of when I did it. And all the feelings and all the emotions and the conversations and, you know, we'll get into all of that. And um, But I really did enjoy this movie. Very much so. Yes, a small disclaimer to, to everybody. You may want to grab your box of tissues while you're listening to this review. It's because me and Nick were talking. We're going to get real. Uh-huh. We're going we're to bring it on this episode. I so. may or may not cry. So, so Just for a warning. <laughs> we're aware of it. Spoilers you, within the spoilers. If you, if you hear some sniffling, we don't have colds. We're just getting no. real. So, um, all right. So, yeah, I, I think it was, for me, it was interesting just getting into there because we, we showed up about 15 minutes before the movie, 20 minutes before the movie, mm-hmm. and there weren't many seats. And that no. surprised me because it's St. Patrick's Day today while I was recording. And so happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was pretty full. So we get in there, and first thing I notice is a lot of teenage girls. Yeah, which to me, in, in retrospect, I don't find all that shocking. Yeah, because it's it it's written and it's marketed to that age group mm-hmm. that you know fourteen to like twenty yeah, year olds. But um, yeah, that the makeup of that audience. Uh, Aaron has a interesting spin on it. If you would like to share yeah, with the I, class, I think it's about fifty percent teenage girls. You're looking mm-hmm. at that fifteen to eighteen range, maybe even a couple thirteen or fourteen year olds thrown in there. Um, another twenty five thirty percent were gay men. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other, I don't know, what's that leave me at? Uh, math. What, 15, 20%? I, I'm an English teacher. I don't do <laughs> math. Um, but the rest, yeah, there were a handful of older people, older couples, and then myself. Um, yeah, it, it really, the primary uh, groups that we, we saw were the, the young girls and the gay gentlemen. Actually, our row had quite a few. And yes. That, it was pretty funny. There were a couple moments where... Who had some lines where they erupted? It was pretty funny. Um, yeah, it was it was it was an interesting audience. We'll talk about that as we go through. That um, it almost there were times where we were rolling our eyes because we we're like, oh come on, like yeah. you're reacting like that. But then there were other times where I think it was really cool to see the reactions, the actual like, the, you know, immediate real reactions yeah. from the audience, which is cool. It's, I don't get that opportunity because usually people are very like respectful and they're just like, oh, that's really cool. Or, but no, like people were on an emotional ride with yeah, this. They were was, going it was, through it, it. I mean, they were they were connecting and they were feeling things. And I mean, I, th- I think it helped support you know what was going on and what we were experiencing as the movie went on. Yeah, I agree. Um, so jumping into the plot, the movie starts with a voiceover by Simon. Uh, kind of talking about, you know, the setting up his life, his friends, his family life, um, but saying that he has a secret. Um, it's not explicitly said for a while in the movie what it is. Very, because that voiceover is in the trailer. Yes, and, and it also ends up being his first email correct. that he sends. Yes, so I was surprised. I was waiting for it because, you know, you go through, he tells this, you know, voiceover, and then it, you go straight into your opening credits, mm-hmm. and we start meeting characters, and we're like, okay... Okay, is he going to say it? Because we all know it going in. We've yeah. all seen the trailer. We wouldn't be here if we didn't know what was going on. Yeah. So, I mean, it was probably good, 
what, 15, 20 minutes into the movie before we actually heard him say, um, my one big secret is that I'm gay? Yeah, it, it was, I mean, and that was one of the things is they built it up with plot rather than just explicitly saying it, yeah. which for me is very cool, a very cool way of writing because that's kind of how the experience seems to be, whereas yes. you live a lot more of it, but the actual saying of the words it doesn't come right away. No, it does not. It is, um, we'll get to this when we get to a point um, in the movie that it actually happens, mm-hmm. but the first time that you actually say that you're gay and you physically tell somebody is a big moment. Mm-hmm. And it is very emotional. And like I said, we'll get to that when we get to that point. But, I mean, I really, I liked it. I liked the fact that they didn't say it right away. Yeah, and we'll talk about it. There was a lot of very clear chosen symbolism and imagery um in this movie and that to me was kind of one of the first ones Mm -hmm. um you know the fact that they they didn't say he he trails off with i i'm just like you except for i have one big secret and that was it and then Mm -hmm. we're like okay like we thought and especially after he interacts with the guy who's uh but with his boots he's leaf blowing i thought like he'd get into his car and they would say i'm gay no like no they just kept going because that's the the, when i saw the trailer that's where it says he's Mm -hmm. in it he sits in his car and he bangs his head against his car horn says i'm gay yeah but i I was expecting that i was like okay i see you movie i see you movie (laughs) all right (laughs) and and yeah so we kind of get an establishment of his life um his friends you have um leah who we mentioned was um Catherine langford who is in 13 reasons why which by the way have you seen that yes i have oh oh you want to talk about going through it that 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 is a very well written show and um there are some character crossovers. Mm-hmm. There's, There's a couple. The guy who played Cal was one of yes. the the characters um, in the in Thirteen Reasons as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's that's another one that you need to watch it. Um, and that that talks that that's that's another issue. You know, so this one deals with coming out and you know this idea of um, you know growing up in a, a world that is not as open to gays. It, well, more so now, but doesn't matter if it's open or not. It's a tough situation. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, there are 13 reasons why dealing with mental health and does a really good job with it. So um, if you haven't go, uh, haven't seen that yet, go check that out Definitely. on Netflix. Uh, but yeah, so his, uh, Leah is Catherine Langford. You also have um, Nick and Abby. Uh, and that's kind of the core group. Yeah, there's uh, your, your kind of, your main characters you yeah. know, that you're going to focus on throughout the course of the movie. And then we get into school and we see... Um, we see a couple of the other characters, a couple of my favorite characters, actually, the teachers, yes. um, which you had um, the the princi- or the vice principal, vice which principal. is Tony Hale, which you would have seen as the youngest, uh, the younger brother on Arrested Development. That's mm-hmm. where he was seen. Um, and I'm starting, to, I'm starting to realize that I'm getting older when I start to find myself relating more to the adults in these kind of movies. Right. Where I'm like, yes, absolutely. Like, put your phone away. Like... So I have to say, between the two, you know, teacher characters that we see in this movie, the vice principal and then the theater teacher, it's like they took Aaron, divided him in half, and made two separate people. It's really funny to see because, you know, when when Aaron talks about his students and how, you know, I know many of his students, how they talk about him, like... I see him as this vice principal, like greeting all the, all the kids in the hallway as they're yep. going to class, and they're all like, but it's it's different. They're like, "Hey, Lopez!" Like as they're going by and stuff. And then you have the crazy theater teacher that is also Aaron. Oh so. my god, that Miss Albright. She she made this movie so so hilarious because it added those those theater you know anecdotes that Aaron and I really do enjoy. Because, well, you know, the first because... time we meet her, she's sitting there. They're they're singing cabaret, uh, the 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 main song from cabaret, and it's not good. And they're singing it. and We're just sitting there because we've been through these rehearsals where it's not and it's not going well. Mm-hmm. And she claps and she's like, "Those are real. My hands are you know, my hands are tired. Tired now." And she uh, she's like, "That was uh, Cal. Help me out." He goes, "That was a start. That was a start. start. That that is that was a start." And it was just like, yeah, it was, it was funny because this character says exactly what anybody who has directed high schoolers in a theatrical performance think of, oh, this is horrible. We have so much work to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was hilarious. She she was that kind of teacher who will say whatever needs to be said. And at one point, there's even uh, some students who say, you can't say that to us. And she goes, yes, I can. I just did. Like, yep. 
she's the kind of teacher who will say whatever she needs to say, and she was hilarious saying it too, which I, I just absolutely love. So yeah, we, we we meet these teachers, we meet her friends, um, we kind of see the world that he's living in, mm-hmm. um, where just... you have like the bullies who are kind of teasing Ethan, who is um, the one gay character that we see like throughout, and um, very confident at yes. least you know throughout the, the movie. Very confident in. Very stereotypical. I mm-hmm. thought, and I was expecting a level of that throughout the course of the movie, but I, it wasn't all the way through the movie. It was very focused on this one character. Who is which, not stereotypical at all. Like, there there wasn't, at least, I mean, there are things that you could see, but if you, you think of a stereotypical gay person, Ethan fulfilled a lot of those. Yes. He, Simon he, really did. Simon did not. And... Um, Ethan really did, but Ethan had a different spin to where he was very confident and stood up for himself, Mm -hmm. which in these kind of um, high school age movies, you don't see that out of characters. You do not see these characters standing up for themselves and fighting for themselves and standing up to the bully. Um, And I thought that was very refreshing to see. But, you know, I also really liked the, the aspect of his family. His family dynamic, which comes into play, um, it touches on that in the beginning. Simon. Yeah, Simon's yeah. family, sorry. No, that's fine. Um, you know, his dynamic of, you know, his mom and his dad are high school sweethearts, and it didn't just stop there, you know. They're both very successful. His sister loves to cook. The dad being the, the quarterback, all-star quarterback, yes. mom valedictorian. Like, right. Very man, Expectations very, being yes. set up, yeah. But completely beyond that. And I just, when you see that, especially in the beginning, you're like, okay, this is very, like, it touches on Leave it to Beaver a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's so much more. But I really, I, I really enjoyed this setup. Yeah, and, and you know, af- as we get into it, you know, the, the movie, the first, like, half hour felt like a lot of setup outside of this one plot point, which we'll kind of go right mm-hmm. into, where Leah, and I don't remember the name of the website. Um, it was... was it, Whatever the name of the school was, Secrets. It was like it was a blog. Yeah, and they hint on it that um, she is obsessed with that website, and she looks at it all the time. And Simon's like, I never look at it. Um, but then one day he gets a FaceTime um, call from from her and says, "You need to look at this." Uh, it's look about at the closet gay kid yes. at school. And he's thinking someone's saying something about him. Correct, yeah. because at that time he thinks he's the only closeted one. He kind of panics, runs mm-hmm. to his computer. And sees this post, and that's kind of where our main storyline begins. Yeah. You know, and it's this concept, so the the post is of um, a student who talks about, you know, they they have a secret, um, they're gay, and they haven't told anybody. Mm -hmm. Um, They feel like they're on a Ferris wheel, sometimes they're at the highest of highs, and sometimes they're back on the low end. Um, And they sign it as blue. And so now you Simon sees this and he goes and he's like, I want to respond. I want to say mm-hmm. something. So he goes and he creates a new um, a email account and um, responds. And he responds as Jacques, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, but he responds as Jacques. So you have this, this kind of back and forth anonymous email from two people who have um, just anonymous email addresses going back and forth, and this sets up really the the underlying plot point of the mm-hmm. movie. Yes, it's on all those. But he, um, you know, he emails this um, this guy back and forth, and really they both get the opportunity opportunity to open up um, and talk about you know their feelings of how of what they're going through because neither of them have anybody to talk to. And now they found each other by accident and they really, they connect and that relationship grows and it grows and it grows. Um, all with the underlying issue of Simon has no idea who this person is. He knows that he goes to his school because it was on their, you know, mm-hmm. their school site, but he has no idea who this person is. Um, he kind of projects, um, ideas of whom it might be, but, they all get shot down. Yeah, and that's, I kind of I like the way that they did that. Yeah, uh, that and and the very ignorant fifteen year old girls. Every time it showed who the person was, they immediately thought, "Oh, that's the reveal!" Like, mm-hmm. no, it's him thinking that this person is it's the projection. And they're like, "Oh my gosh, it's this person!" And oh my gosh, no, finally. I was like, no, guys, just chill. Like, they're not going to tell you in the first 20 minutes. Exactly. Who it's not going to work out. Like, 
for me, I thought it was the dude with the leaf blower who Simon says he likes I was his thinking, boots. Yeah, I, I thought, was like, hmm. I yeah. went through about five or six different suspicions as the movie went on, but that was my first one, um, just because of um, the first time we see the anonymous blue character typing. Um, we see like the bottom half of his face, and yeah, you see like his arms because like so this guy with a leaf blower and everything in the beginning is very muscly guy, mm-hmm. um, and you see him and when it cuts to that other. Um, the blue typing scene, you're like, wait a minute, that looks vaguely familiar. Yeah, it he really did. starts getting, makes you guess. Okay, okay. So, so yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things. So, I I really enjoyed the the suspension of um, at least with even in the the earlier plot where Simon's checking his phone constantly. He wants yes. a response from Blue, and that's this idea. Like he wants to be able to talk about this. Mm-hmm. Um, he doesn't know how. He doesn't know what he wants to say, but he just wants to be able to talk about it. And he's not mentioned it to anybody. Leah, his best friend, has no idea. His parents don't know. His sister doesn't know. Um, but everybody, he's very, very close to all these people, but he doesn't have anybody to talk to about it. No. And so Blue's his opportunity to talk about it, and so he's like, I want a response. And he gets that response, and then it's like, okay. And then it, it builds off it of there. It goes and goes, yep. Uh, which kind of leads us into our conflict that uh, that happens outside of just the internal conflict. Um so there's a character that we meet fairly early, Martin. Um, Martin is the annoying ki- like kid from high school who's not like awkward or he's not a like a horrible person, but you just you know they're trying too hard yeah. to try to fit in with everything. They they have this persona and they're not really themselves, but they like you know. So we, when we see Martin, he approaches and um, the first shirt he's wearing is a Caddyshack shirt, like. And they even bring up this this idea, like, dude, girls don't want to read your shirt. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got all these graphic tees, and I gotta say, I, that was me in high school. I yeah, had like me too a hundred graphic tees with like you know Old Navy and all. Yeah, that was all the rage back then. But he's got this, <laughs> and Martin's this kid who he ends up playing um, the MC in Cabaret, and um, he wants he, he wants to to date. Abby, you be with her. Yeah. Um, and we can see that the first time we see him, he like comes up it's, and he's like, it's, hey. It's that awkward, hi. Yeah. You know. We've all just, seen it. Not trying, always. Sometimes right. it was us. Even. Yeah, we've had, we've all had those moments trying to strike up a conversation with the person that you like and you have nothing to talk to them about. And that kind of opens that can of worms and we go down that whole plot path of, you know, everybody wants to date Abby and everybody's in love with Abby because and she's a beautiful girl, but... Um, to me, it got a little much. Like Everybody. Three, th- I mean, three of those characters, you know, outwardly said, you know, they want to date her. And then, like you said, it's we're talking about our conflict, but it got a little much. Yeah, Abby was a, a focal much. point on the mm-hmm. side, which to me was kind of surprising in some way. I thought it would have been Leah's character. That I thought so too. Or at least a split. Like, no one cared about Leah at all. No, which sucked because she was a very, very um, interesting character to me. You know, the the best friend um, is always somebody that kind of just gets pushed off to the side. But I really liked how her character was written Mm -hmm. as to be such a strong support system in their little core group of friends. Yeah. I liked her. I liked her a lot. And and so we're talking about Martin. um, And before we get into Martin specifically in the conflict, Martin's friend, which was not a named character, but this giant, skinny... is he Indian or I, I, in, something like he, that? The kid was huge. He was so tall. They even made a joke about it later in the movie. Yeah, where he's putting something up, and she's like, "You didn't even use a ladder." Like it, he, the kid's the kid is at least seven foot, at least maybe like seven five, like just a giant. And didn't re- I don't think he said anything. No, the whole movie. I don't think so. But I just thought it was funny because I'm like, why? Why do you need this other than the one line with the ladder joke? Like that that kid was that pointless was, to the movie. Yeah. But anyways, I just I had to talk about the giant because I, 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 first time we see him in the hallway, I'm like, oh my god, he's that huge, kid's huge. Um, but Martin um, goes into the library, and this actually happens pretty early into the movie. Yep. Um, he goes into the library and he gets on the computer that Simon was on, um, and Simon didn't log out. Um, the principal, the vice principal, came up and was talking to him. And he kind of like turned off the monitor to try to hide the fact that he was emailing back and forth. And, and then the bell rang and he left. Um, so Martin comes up and notices that Nick was the last one on that computer. Not sorry, Nick. Uh, Simon was the last one on that computer. Mm-hmm. And he starts going through and reading the emails. Um, 
he ends up taking screenshots of the emails and starts and talks to Simon saying, basically, um, I want you to get me an in with Abby and like, doesn't explicitly say he's going to blackmail him, but makes it very much implied. Like if you don't help me out, I'm going to tell I'm gonna everybody this. Yeah. And I, I mean the, the actor was, I don't know his name, but he did a good job with this. I liked um, it. I, I liked that part. Um, it was just very, it was very, um, he wasn't like mean about it. It wasn't like a, you know, a stereotypical jock finds out and says, oh, I'm going to tell the whole school. It was, I'm going to kind of hold this over your head so you can help me. I need your help. Mm -hmm. And this is the only way I'm going to be able to get that help. Well, establish this concept of the fear of someone finding out. Yes. Um, And I think that plays into the ultimate story is like of coming out needs to be the person's uh who's who's gay their choice and martin was this idea of it may not be up to me and i want to prevent that from happening Mm -hmm. so there's not only conflict but internal fear going on there too yeah because when you're in that kind of a situation and you're you're standing on the edge of deciding i'm ready to do this that It's something that's so personal to you. You don't want anybody to take that away from you. And I could not, you know, imagine if, if that had happened to me, um, if somebody was on the verge of outing me Mm -hmm. just because you don't, you want to do it in your own time. You want to do it in your own way. You just don't want the, the whole world to know yet. You, you start small and then you work from there. But this, this level of internal conflict of, I don't want people to know yet is is very pivotal not only to the um, to the plot of the movie but just to Simon's character and what he goes through um, throughout the course of the movie. It drives his pretty much from this moment on everything that he does is to prevent other people from finding yes. out. Like it's that is his one character development piece that is present through the rest of the movie up until the moment where it's no longer present like it's it's like you said pivotal is a very strong uh description um so we we have this back and forth um we essentially i think the next real big play in this is with the halloween party yeah Um, halloween party is a big moment we have the idea that he's like hey we're having a party on brahm's throwing a party um and simon invites martin to come with and because he's like, well, maybe, you know, I could, that's that's the best thing I can do. Like, mm-hmm. I'm going to invite you. You can hang out with us. And so they show up to, I believe it's Leah's house. I don't know whose house it was. Mark, it was maybe Nick. It was Nick's house. Nick's house. Everybody shut up to Nick's that's house. That's right. And um, Simon and Leah are dressed up as John Lennon and Yoko, which I thought was pretty funny. Fantastic. God, it just tells you the type of, of kids they are because you've got, that's who they dress up as. Yeah. They drink iced coffee. Like, they'd listen to, you know, random kind of almost indie music. You know, the kid's got a, he had a Hamilton playbill, Simon, on his um, cork board. Mm-hmm. Like, you can start piecing this together, and you're like, okay, like, you know, the kind they're, of yeah, friend group that they are. Yeah, there's little anecdotes that kind of say, oh, okay, that makes sense. Okay. But yeah, for, the, for that combination, I thought was absolutely fantastic, because they could have shown up as, you know, anybody else, and it wouldn't have play to their characters so much because they are I hate to use the the kids phrase but they're woke you know they understand what's going on they understand yeah. what's come before them they're not you know they know who's come before them and it's pretty cool well and yeah. I again this symbolism that there are so many pieces that don't if you don't think about them you're just like oh okay yep but the concept that Yoko broke up the Beatles as you know everybody talks about and this this idea that Simon's secret, I mean, essentially at one point in the movie breaks up the friends. Um, that is, that's awesome. I yeah, was, I went that, full English teacher. Y- yeah, in this you did. Analysis. Yeah, you did. That's that's very because, analytical. Of it. And there's another one that I'll get to that we'll oh. see if you caught, but I don't want to say it yet. Okay. Um, but yeah, so the, yeah, like this idea that as we find out that uh, Simon starts playing his friends to keep his secret, mm-hmm. and so he utilizes there's this outside influence that is not part of the initial friend group that 
becomes a, a driving force uh, that w- you know a wedge really between yeah. the friends. So I thought that was kind of an interesting decision because it could have been anybody, like you said. Really, they could have showed up as any, and they chose that. Yeah, that symbolism that was hardcore symbolism. If you if if you understand it, which you know that audience that it like we said it marketed to, they don't get that. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I. And then Martin shows up, and I am oh sorry, but this I loved this. Of course you did. It was stupid, <laughs> but I loved it. So he he shows up. He's ringing the doorbell um, at Nick's, and they're all upset. All the friends are like, "Why'd you invite him?" He's like, well, I, I thought it would be fun. Like, So he invites him, and he's ringing the doorbell, he opens the door, and he's got a white beard, or like a grayish beard on, um, a sweater, and a slip with words on it like ego, id, you know, those things. And he's like, what are you? I'm a Freudian slip. And I was like, yes, oh, you God. are. That was that hilarious. Was... Oh, but it was... just shows you because everybody else's costumes were very well well thought out. Yes, and he he comes shown up uh, dressed as a pun, and it's like okay, yeah. it, well that's very much his character. That's Martin. You know, again along the lines of the um, um, the graphic tees and the mm-hmm. and the the reading shirts and the the puns. It was just another level. I saw that and he said it, and I was like, that, this is terrible. <laughs> I'm not a pun person, but oh god, <laughs> that was terrible. Oh, and he's a guy who does magic, too. Like, you oh, add all yeah. this together, and you're like, oh, geez. I forgot about the magic. Like, he's a good... He, and in reality, he's not a bad person. Um, he, he took advantage of a situation, so he made a bad decision. But he's just an awkward kid, and probably made a decision that... Well, and he ends up doing some things that people were, weren't happy with, but he wasn't a bad person. He no. just was very ignorant, I think. Yeah. Um, and just ignorant and socially awkward. Very socially awkward, but he tried. You know, he wasn't one, of, wasn't the kind of person that just accepts that he's socially awkward and doesn't talk to anybody. He really forces himself to to be in those situations, which is a different kind of character than than what we normally see. Yeah, and and to to go off of that, I loved. There was a line that he said. So Simon goes over to his house um, because he's like, all right, well, let's see if there's anything that is not gonna completely. Um, push Abby away from you. Like he's like, what do we have to work with as far as who you are? And he's like, you have to do this. You have to do this. And he's like, I don't want. I didn't invite you over here to change me. I invited you over here because um, I want your help with her liking me for who I am. Yeah. You don't hear that. You don't ever. No, you don't. I mean, even into adulthood, people are saying that. You know, it was very. I thought it was really cool to see that, and that character, um, the Martin character, is very. I don't want. I don't want to say overdeveloped, but he goes through a big journey in the, in this movie, and that was really the kind of start that sets up his character to be like, okay, he's gonna kind of be awesome. Yeah, and, and, and I, I liked that. Like, yeah. He he was himself. He never really he never he changed never himself. changed himself. Yeah. He was absolutely one hundred percent Martin the entire run of the movie. And I think you know we'll, we're not done talking about Martin. We'll talk nope. about him a little bit. Um, but this party, so a lot happens. Um, Basically, everything revolves around um, Simon's initial thought that Brom could be blue. Yes. Um, so a lot happens with that. But then also a lot happens with Abby. Um, there's a lot that revolves around that whole love triangle with Nick, Martin, and Abby. Um, Leah kind of gets forgotten at the party itself. She's there, but she's not really a focal point. Um, but then you have Simon and Brom, and Simon's going out of his way. He's drinking. He's very. He's he's not the person that he is, and they refer, they refer to that later on in the evening. But he's trying something new. Mm-hmm. He's because he's trying to be the person he thinks Brom wants him to be because he thinks Brom is blue. Yes, he is very much very convinced at this point, and this is the first character that we see. Um, projected as blue, and mm-hmm. that was the first. Oh, I knew it was him. Yeah. You know, moments that you have from your audience, but you know, they go through the party. They play. Um, what do they call beer pong? They call it called something else. Um, Beirut. Beirut. I never heard. I never heard it called that. that either. And they're um, like, "Have you ever played Beirut?" And I'm like, "Hell, I've never played Beirut." And they but, start describing it. I'm like, "Oh, you're talking it's, about it's beer, it's beer pong." So beer they pong. go through. They play beer pong, and then they go um, inside because one of the other characters talked about um, when they're talking about playing in the party uh i bring my karaoke machine and they you know they have full-blown karaoke um the night progresses things go on um they're drinking obviously they're um uh, intoxicated you see nick passed out on the couch you see um 
you know, just people just falling all over the place. And then we kind of see our first um, moment of, I don't want to say heartbreak, but um, a, yeah. a little bit of heartbreak. I say it wouldn't be far off. Yeah. yeah. So um, at that at this point, Simon um, goes upstairs to go, you know, you kind of build up the courage to, to go talk to Braun because he's, he's fairly confident that it's him, goes yeah. upstairs, um, goes into the bedroom and very um, stereotypically finds him making out with a girl. Um, and he is shocked and heartbroken for a second, kind of stands there and says, uh, you know, I thought this was the bathroom. Because he just spent, you know, however many minutes pumping himself up in the bathroom. Yeah. You know, we see a little glimpse of him talking to himself, making really terrible rhymes, talking about him being yeah. jock. And, it, yeah, you can tell he was drunk. So when you see that first moment, you... <laughs> it was very much a oh no like you feel for him and it felt it was very sad to see him go through that moment of heartbreak almost so soon but you knew it was going to happen yeah and you, it's you, too early in the movie for us to find early. all this out um and speaking of if of these really bad rhymes we didn't we didn't talk about brahm's outfit so they show up and they're like oh who are you and he's dressed up uh, in a white shirt with a lay on and he's like, I'm post presidency Barack Obama. Oh, so good. And I was like, so good. I was, I was mentioning tonight that I, we're finally in that moment where movies can refer to Barack as a former president. Yep. And he even says, I hope Donald Trump doesn't ruin my legacy. Like, I was like, that's that's, that's awesome. I mean, this is we're a progressive there. movie in and of itself, but then they throw that in your face. And yeah. You're like, okay, they are just. Um, you know, the liberal ideal in this movie is just, it's in your face. There's a moment, we're going to get to that. I hope that is, oh, I'm so excited to talk about this moment. But um, it's very much a very liberal movie, and they, it puts it in your face. But that costume, I think the only thing that could have made that costume better was to turn it into an Obama-Biden meme. Yeah. In some way, shape, or form. Yeah, that'd That's been what, it. That, but that costume was fantastic. So good. So good. But, um... I yeah, I loved it. it. I thought it was great. I, I, fantastic. Um, so the he goes, uh, he, he sees the Simon does, and he goes downstairs. Um, and before we jump to that, we need to mention you mentioned Nick was passed out. Before that scene, Nick um, basically starts talking mm. to Simon, saying how he he's really into Abby. Yes. Um, and this is the first of or the second of now three characters who've said that they're into Abby. Martin is, um, Nick is, and we'll find out later another character is. Um, and so, and he actually, Simon deters him from it. He's like, mm -hmm. no, he's in, she's into this old, this college guy who's really experienced. And so then Nick's like, oh, okay. And he kind of backs off. So that this is Simon planting the seeds of doubt in his friends because Martin needs to get with Abby. So Correct. Martin doesn't yes. leak anything. And his secret stays safe. Well, Martin's had a few too many to drink, and um, this was just disgusting. But as you said oh. in the theater, you could see it coming. Yep. Um, he comes. Simon comes down the stairs for after seeing Brom with the girl, and uh, Martin's coming up to him, and he's like, he's he's not in the mood to talk to him. He's just seen this; it's really upset him. And Martin throws up on him, and it's like it's all over him. It's like somehow everywhere. He, the way he threw up was like you know from like maybe belt down like pants. But then you see Simon, and it's, like, all over his, like, neck and shirt, too. And I'm like, oh, that's gross. That is just gross. That's just terrible. Oof. So Oof. Leah takes him home. Um, they go back, and he finds out his parents are still awake. And he's like, oh, no, crap. Uh, and she's like, just don't say anything. And they go inside. And I thought this was kind of a funny moment, too. Uh, disgusting moment thrown in there, too. Mm -hmm. But their dog's name is Beaver, which I thought was hilarious. Hilarious. I, I thought it was Beaver, like leave it to yeah. Beaver, for the longest time until I was like, they, they referred to him as Beebs, and I was like, oh, that's even better. <laughs> so Beaver, they, they come in, so Simon and Leah are in the, the they, they come in and the parents are like, oh, come talk to us, how's the party, you know, and <laughs> Leah tells him before they go in, like, just say the least amount of say words as possible. as little words as possible. She's like, we had a good time. It was really fun. And, and Simon comes around and he goes, aces. Aces. <laughs> like, you said one word and that was enough to let everyone in the room know you were drunk. Yep. It's that <laughs> whole, I'm trying to pretend to be sober and I just am blatantly intoxicated. Like, we've all been there. Yep. We've all done it. But it was just... It, well, it, you see Beaver licking his shoes oh, and God. it's like, 
Oh, that 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 makes you gag a little Continuity bit. Continuity moment. So when Martin throws up on him at the party, it was like red and mm-hmm. pink. You don't see him drink anything that's colored because you really you just see him drink beer. Mm-hmm. But then when this is absolutely disgusting, when you see Beaver licking the shoes, it looks like actual vomit. Yeah. So I was like, mm, continuity. Yeah, I don't. I called that up. one because because the shirt itself had just like this clear pink. It looked like someone threw like a light colored fruit punch on him. Yeah. But then there's actual like orangish pukish looking With like, chunks in it. Yeah. Ugh. On the shoe, and I, that I caught that too. I was like, well, that's a funny moment. Doesn't completely make sense. But, but we'll it's not. It. It's, it's like, all right, great, we'll move on. Um, but then they go upstairs, and the parents they say, um, "Well, our son was wearing a female shirt sweater, clearly intoxicated. How do we feel about, about that?" This. And Jennifer Garner goes, "Well, he didn't didn't drive. He's home before curfew. He's safe. I think we're okay I'm with it. Okay with it. That's what I thought. But it, what's so funny is that these two, you know, Jennifer Garner and Josh Tamel, they are like." The most progressive parents that you will see, like, I, you know, they say Jennifer Garner's character is a therapist because mm-hmm. earlier in the in the movie he said um, Simon says, you know, don't psycho psychoanalyze me. I'm not one of your patients, whatever. But you know, this is obviously progressive because I know if my parents had, um, if I had come home drunk, you know, after a party, which may have had happened <laughs> or two, once or twice, but they never knew they were asleep. Yeah, but. They would have freaked out. I would have been grounded and taken the car and all this kind of stuff. But that just, they were like, okay, those characters were very progressive. Yeah. Um, so it was interesting to see. But the, those two, I swear, there was, a lot of their stuff had to have been ad lib Because just the way of the delivery was very much like, this is not scripted. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like that conversation, that, 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 had, to that have had to have been, you know, um, ad lib Because it was just too, it was too real. It was too funny. Well, I think for me, when you look at... This I, I was a, I was very happy with the decision to make the parents more you know progressive because yes. they could have made the parents very much like no I don't like this this is a this is awkward I don't, you know I don't understand it and that would have been another thing but there was there was enough throughout the the movie and especially once things start to become more open that he went through a lot and mm-hmm. if they would have added another piece. It would have added another half hour to the movie, and it would, it would have, have made been. it feel like he had no nothing going for him. It would have made... So it spun, with the parents being progressive, it spun it in a way that they could focus more on the love story between him and Blue versus mm-hmm. the actual coming out. If they were... If they had issues with it, if they had problems with it, the, the second half of the movie, well, second, the last third of the movie, I should say, um, would be more focused on that aspect versus him finding out who Blue is, confessing his love, all that kind of stuff that we'll get into. But um, part of me, I actually kind of hoped that that, had, that was the way the movie was going to go. Because that, to me, that's real. Mm-hmm. That's what happens. You don't always have parents that are okay with it and loving and accepting. You have people, you have parents that they have questions, they're confused. You know, it touches on it a little bit, but not it, I mean, as much as I, I honestly yeah. I wanted it to. The parent, the parents do have questions, but they, um, they do feel like this is fairly normal. Like, um, it was almost the friends who had gave him a harder time than yeah. the parents, which is usually the opposite. Usually, your friends are very. I mean, but the friends. I mean, I say that, but I can't completely. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're yeah. gonna jump ahead. But yeah. the friends spun more of it onto themselves. They, they made it opinion. about themselves. They absolutely. made it about them, absolutely. and not so much about what he was, what had just happened to him, which we which, will get to. Which seems like that's what parent, what parents, what I hear yeah. parents usually do is yes. like they make it about themselves. But the friends usually seem to be like, okay, mm-hmm. like great. Um, but yeah, we'll get to that in a little bit. We're uh, we're just a little ahead of ourselves. Um, but so after the party, Leah goes back and they have a small moment um, upstairs of her talking about, do you ever feel like I'm out of place? Mm-hmm. Like, um, And it's kind of like, well, yeah, he very much feels that way. And um, she's trying to tell him, like, you know, do you ever feel like, I wish I could be somebody who just takes a couple shots and hooks up with the nearest person, but I feel like I'm destined to be the one person who cares about somebody so much it kills me. Mm-hmm. And we're like, for me, I was like, oh, she's in love with Simon. Yeah, I was like, I, I just saw it. You, it was, it, that was blatant. They don't, there's no tell, and he kind of goes away. But even like, when he says like, oh, good night, because he doesn't want to talk about it because he feels like it's going to get to a moment where he mm-hmm. might come out. He's not ready for it. 
Um, he says goodnight to her, and he opens up his laptop and starts like texting or emailing Blue. Uh, but you can see the shot that she's still awake, and she's get, she even says like, "Hey, Sai, goodnight." Like it's like she wants to tell him. And you're like, "Oh, she's clearly head over heels for this guy." Yeah, but it, if you don't see it that way, you can see it as she knows. And she's trying to get him to a point to be, it's okay to tell me. And I can, that's I the, can see that. You know, when I talked about earlier being her being so supportive, that's the character point. You know, where she's like, it's okay to tell me. I want to be there for you. Let me support you. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it, it was they spun it in a way to where she was trying to confess yeah. her love for him. Which... It was kind of obvious to see it. Yeah, it was kind of like, yeah, this, this is this is pretty clear. Yeah. Um, before we're gonna go to break here, and but before we go to break, I really I have to say I am extremely jealous of Simon's room, the way it was I like know. set up. So like his bed oh. was so basically, if you were to come into a room and you have the four walls, one of them was like built in so that his bed wasn't part of the room. His bed was like. In a wall. Yeah, it was almost um, like having, like, um, you know, I used to build a fort inside of my closet to where, you know, I put pillows and blankets and stuff in there. It was that, but it was built into the room, so it was enough enough of a space where you had a small shelf on one side, you know, butt up against the window, which mm-hmm. is awesome, but your mattress and your box spring and everything's in there. Into it's, the, it's just so cool. And the walls were chalkboard paint. Chalkboard paint. I was like, that is... And I heard somebody else made the comment... Um, in the audience, I want that room. It like, looked cool. It was so cool. I was really jealous, but again, movie metrics. Yeah, I, I I'm gonna have to talk to to Jordan and say that when we get a house that we need chalkboard paint in our rooms. chalkboard paint and dry erase board paint. They're dangerous. And just, and just have a have a good time. You know, put a put a nice wall bed in. Yes. Uh, yeah, so let's go ahead and uh, take a break. Let's go. All, let's all go to the lobby. Nick and I need to refill our drinks. Yes. Uh, you guys go do that as well. And let us see what is coming up soon from Eventide. If there's one thing that's true about wrestling fans, it's how much they like to talk about wrestling. Join Aaron Lopez and Ben Norsworthy for the Top Rope Wrestling Podcast. Uh, Let's get ready to rumble! Tune in every episode and be ringside as these two break down all of the big matches in the world of professional wrestling. Brought to you by Eventide Entertainment. You know, there's nothing quite as satisfying as a good conversation with intelligent company. Join comedian Don Smith every week as he sits down and talks with comedians, actors, filmmakers, writers, and everyday schmoes. It's The Life with Don Smith. Wednesdays at noon on 106.9 FM and now available on the Eventide Entertainment Podcast feed every Friday on Spreaker, YouTube, and iTunes. All right, welcome back to the second half of the drive-in. Uh, we just got done talking about the Halloween party, uh, the aftermath of that with the parents and, mm-hmm. and whatnot, uh, and this kind of shifts us into the next, the second of three phases, really, with the kind movie. Of, if you kind of look at it in a theater aspect, it's like act two. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have Martin, who's not completely happy with how the party went, so he kind of he's pushing this idea still of... We we need to get Abby involved with me. I'm yeah. You know, I still want her to to like me. Didn't go as well, so let's try something else. Um, and and he does the. I love the how how he actually gets to talk to Simon with the paper cut. And it's like very clearly. Yes. Oh wow! Ooh, I got a I got a paper cut. You can, can Simon? Can you show me where the the band aids are? It's like all right. Like let's, we get it. Yeah. Let's let's be a little more obvious about it, but. You know, it's fine. It's fine. You do you. Yeah. And, <laughs> and Simon says, like, hey, uh, when Abby happens to come back in the same area where they're talking, and he's like, hey, um, Martin wanted to run lines. He's having trouble with his lines. And Abby mentions earlier, if you know Cabaret at all, she's Sally Bowles, and Sally's on stage for, like, 90% the entire, of the said, show. She says Sally Bowles never shuts up the entire show. And I'm like, that's an actually accurate yes. statement. The girl talks and sings the entire show. 
And so she's very much having problems with her lines. Yes. She's like, all right. So they go to Waffle House, which these kids love Waffle House. I hate Waffle House. Same. Oh, my God. It's disgusting. Like, I don't understand. There's a little side break here. There's two types of people in the world. People who eat good breakfast food and people who eat food like Denny's and Waffle House. <laughs> and, like, I've never had... So, like... Back where I'm, I'm from in Illinois, we had Denny's. We had like a place called Village Inn, which Village Inn's kind of like a Perkins. Um, if you know, if you don't know either of those, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, but Denny's was the crap. Denny's was like shit breakfast, bottom of the barrel, and nasty. Everybody Oof. knew if you went to Denny's, you were going to wake up with diarrhea. Yes. Like you, it was awful. But so very few people went to Denny's. People here in Ohio say the same things about Waffle House, but there's a following of people who are like. Yes, they waffle are, house. So those people, they're the drunk people. They go and they drink. You know, in my opinion, there's two types of drunks. The so they're drunks, my kind of people. Yes, the drunks that go to Waffle House, and then you have the drunks that go to Taco Bell. Taco Bell, Taco Bell, right I'm here. I'm a Taco Bell drunk Same. here. Same. But I've done Waffle House once, literally once in my entire life, and I will never do it again. It made me <laughs> so sick. It was so disgusting. You just, oh, I'm not a fan. I am not a fan, and don't get me started on this tangent, because I'll go all night. <laughs> all night. So they go to Waffle House. Yeah, and, and the food even, like, looked disgusting. Like, they just had, like, I don't know, they had, like, eggs and waffles and pancakes and all this other stuff, and it's just sitting there, and they're not eating it. I'm like, there's your hint. Yeah, there's it's, your Because it's not it's, good. It's nasty. But they go to Waffle House, and it is Simon, Abby, and Martin, and they're doing lines, and this is probably the the moment of the movie, the only moment that I actually liked Martin, truly. I liked his, his staying true to himself. Yes. But he he's his motives behind it are very selfish. But he starts asking Abby about, you know, where she came from. She came from. Very abruptly and very almost um, intimidating. And, yeah. And I, so when this, this thing first started, I was like, I was taken back. I was like, is he really doing this? Do you really... Because Abby doesn't talk about her past. Mm -hmm. This is the first time you hear about it. He's very like, I want to know more. Tell me more. Tell Mm -hmm. me more. When she blatantly does not want to talk about it. Yeah. She wants to start over. She doesn't want to talk about it. But as he continues on, it's, it's it's a breakthrough moment for both characters. Yeah. And it's... It's kind of this idea. So we knew Abby had been most recent because in the description that goes in the very beginning of the movie, Simon says, two of my friends I've known for, you know, over 10 years, like 13 years, and one I've met for three, I met three months ago, but I feel like I've known her my whole life. And Abby's this new student. Mm -hmm. She transferred from D.C., and we don't really know anything about it other than she's just transferred until this Waffle House scene where she opens up about her mom and dad got a divorce. She moved from D.C. to live uh, in the same building as her aunt. Her, you know, found a, a house for, or a place for her and her mom, and she's kind of given up on men because, you know, her dad has put in such a negative aspect of of men and male identity in yeah, her life. She's given up on love. And Martin's like, no, I, you you deserve better than that. You deserve, and he says, there's a line, you deserve a goddamn superhero. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of cheesy, but then he goes, you know what? I want you to say it. And it's like. Yeah, that's that's a powerful moment for her to say like it, you deserve something like this. You be, you need to know that that one person does not represent the entirety of you know um, of a perspective on people. Right. And I really like this. And he and then he goes, "I'm going to keep doing this, and I'm going to keep doing it until you say it," because she doesn't want to. And he stands up and starts yelling it, and it's kind of like awkward. But she finally like says, "Okay, fine." And then by the end of this scene. She believes that, yes, she is a wonderful person, and she deserves a goddamn superhero. superhero. Yeah. I loved it. I thought it was really cool. Um, you know, she she reacts in a, oh, God, don't embarrass us in front of the five people that are in this nasty Waffle House. The truckers the, the, and, the... Uh, the, and the probably drunks. But um, it was, a it, like I said, it was a pivotal moment for both characters. You know, um, Martin connects with Abby on a level that she can finally accept like this guy's okay yeah he's not a a weird dude that wears some weird clothes and says stupid things he's a genuinely good person and abby gets the breakthrough of i am a good enough person she gets that that level of self-acceptance that kind of propels her through the rest of the the movie in my opinion and her her growth that is her first real moment mm-hmm. of um okay she's gonna start doing more and she's gonna be able to to live her life so i i, I personally really like that moment i yeah. thought it was really cool 
but there's more going on at the Waffle House. So yeah, we get another we get another potential blue here. We have um, a the waiter Lyle, who is somebody who is uh, has been in classes with these with all these other characters. Um, kind of one of those guys that you 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 have a familiar face, but you're like, eh, did I have a class with you? I'm mm-hmm. not sure. Um, this is where I kind of I wasn't sure how to look at this, and maybe your perspective may help. Almost immediately when Simon sees Lyle, he has that glow in his face of like, oh, that could be Blue. How, it almost feels like he's so determined to find Blue that it doesn't matter who Blue is. Yeah. It doesn't matter at all if that person is a good person, a bad person, you know, anything about them. If they're Blue, it's all that matters. And I wasn't sure if I liked that or if I was like... It didn't make him come off as desperate, but to me, I kind of almost thought at times it did. It... So the way that Lyle is kind of introduced, you know, he comes up to their table. He's their waiter, which you kind of really don't get waiters at Waffle House. Whatever. I'm going to go down that road again. It's not a good idea. (laughs) But there's this moment of eye contact between Simon and Lyle. And they go back and forth. And, you know, Simon starts to get this smirk on his face. And it's almost like a flirtatious look. And when you are closeted and when you, even when you first come out and you really start looking at men in a certain way and you start connecting i mean not even just men women um do the same thing you're like oh this person is giving me the attention and the looks that i'm looking for mm-hmm. so in my opinion you kind of latch on to that immediately mm-hmm. and that's what he did he latched on to to lyle and you know saw saw him on his phone just before he steps out on a break um and then simon goes out and follows him and tries to talk to him and tries to figure out if this is, if it's real, if, if he's actually blue. And you just, you kind of see a little bit of, I, I see the desperation. I see where you got that aspect from because it, it was there and I've experienced that. I've done that. You know, you, somebody shows you affection and somebody shows you, you know, a level of caring mm-hmm. that you can kind of misconstrue as romantic and you know flirting almost so you kind of go for it and you're you're essentially you're being led on and we learn more about um that process here in a little bit but um you know when you this first connection yeah i agree it's a little desperate and he's just he wants to find out who this person is and the first person that shows him any sign of attention he automatically thinks that's that's who it is i'm glad you said that because it helps me kind of see it in a different way too is of that first attention that you've been looking for because he hasn't gotten that from anybody no. outside of a friendship. And and like I said, there's that glow in his face. So when you said the flirtatious, like, yeah, like that makes sense that this is more than just like, a, oh, hey, this is a guy who kind of is kind of like how Nick is. Like Nick gives him attention, but mm-hmm. it's like they're buddies. Yeah. Um, Ly- that, that look that Lyle gives him is not a, hey, buddy look. It's a little bit more than that. Um, or at least it is perceived as such by Simon. Um so they they leave um, the the Waffle House is it closes down and they, you know no we can wish um, <laughs> now they go home and Simon goes to drop off Abby um, and they're talking about it and, and Abby's kind of showing some interest in, in Martin saying you know hey you know Martin's actually kind of a good guy I never noticed it before um, and he stops the car and he Pulls just over. comes out to her like he just it just kind of is like word vomit like there's a moment where he's thinking about it but then as soon as he does it he says it. Um, and I, I'm just, I, I, it is asked later on why he came out to her of everybody in the movie, of all the family, of all the friends, and he gives it a good explanation. Um, but like, what did you think of, of this, how he says it, her reaction, how does it relate? You know? So this was my first moment that, okay. that I went through it because it took me back to the first time I did it. Okay. And the first time, because like I said earlier, the first time that you say it, it is a huge deal. And I didn't see it so much as word vomit. I saw he was very calculated. He felt comfortable. He said, I need to do it. I need somebody to know. And he said it. And he and felt, he, you could see that he felt You see the, the weight of that come off your shoulders. Yeah. And it, that, it happens. Oh my God, does it happen. I remember the first time I did it. Granted, I wrote it in a note to one of my friends when I was a senior in high school. But when you do it and when you say it, 
it changes things. If one person knows, it completely changes it because it's out there. Mm-hmm. It's it, it's in the open, and you. I don't want to say this um, this um, these lines because they come in, into play later, but you feel like you can breathe a little bit more. Um, and you feel a little bit more comfortable. And personally, I was actually kind of glad that he that he did it to Abby. And, you know, and like you said, she explains it later, or he explains it um, why to her later. But she was the character that was very prominent at that point. Um, yeah, she was. Uh, she she was had a, gotten a lot of screen time over the last twenty minutes. A lot of screen time, and this yeah. is actually the point in the movie where we stop seeing her. She's not so much a focal point because now in the plot, it switches from Abby and this whole love triangle thing and protecting thing to Simon starting the process of coming out. Mm-hmm. And this moment to me was very well done. It was not a trashy you know mockery of it it was genuine and it was personal and i felt that i didn't think i was going to see that in this movie and the the two moments that i talk about this one and one that comes later i did not think i was going to see these moments in this movie and i don't cry in movies it takes a lot but this moment hit me It? it hit me right in the feels and i teared up and because you just you remember and then it put me back in that moment of that scared feeling of what if my friends don't accept me for this yeah what if they you know they turn me away and that was you can tell in this character that he was going through that but when you when he finally did it it was just like a a moment of of pride for him i really liked his first question to her after he says it, he said, did you know? Or, no, no, let me, I'm, I'm mistaken. Yeah. Are you surprised? Are you surprised? And she says no. And, he, and then he immediately, he, he says, did you know then? And she's like, no. So why are you surprised? You know, but you're surprised. you surprised. And she didn't really give a, a really clear answer to it. She just says, you know, that I, it, it just is something that I didn't necessarily, sh- it didn't shock me, but I still love you. Like, I, I, you're my friend. I love you. And that was kind of one of those things that, that was important for him to hear that. Um, because if he wouldn't have, then the rest of the movie would have been very short. I think it would have been very just... short and very dark. Yeah. It, it, could, it, it could have been very dark if he didn't get that acceptance right away. And when you, when you have that moment of you tell somebody, in my opinion, the thing that you don't want to hear is, oh, yeah, we've known. Or it's about time you told us. You know, it should, to me, it's a moment of, um, you, you need that support from the person you're telling. And they kind of play it earlier in the movie. Um, they talk about, um, oh God, what's his name? What's the overly, uh, the stereotypical Martin? No, not that one. Oh, Ethan. 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 Yes. Ethan. Um, they kind of talk about his coming out and when he, so he's sitting in front of a group of the popular girls and he tells them. And they're all like, oh, they're, they're blatantly like, we know, but yeah. we're being still being supportive. Yeah. One of the friends is like, I had no idea. I'm so shocked. And the other one's like, too, too much. much. <laughs> too much. It's like, too much, Tiffany, or whatever her yeah. name was. But it was just like, that's, unfortunately, you know, in my experiences, that's what it was. You know, friends saying, well, it's about time, or, oh, yeah, we already knew. I'm just glad you could finally say it yourself. Like... It's a it's a tough thing to hear from your friends mm-hmm. because then you for me you go back into your mind and be like was I just that obvious and you know now you know god however many years it's been now <laughs> it's like yeah it was that obvious <laughs> well it's funny i mean that you mentioned that cuz you know for the sake of anonymity i won't say his name but i, I we had a friend yep. who came out to um to us and it was a situation where we we pretty much felt that we we had known you know Mm -hmm. like you said it felt like oh it was obvious um but it wasn't our place to say anything about it to him it wasn't our place to you know say that we knew the first things that me and my wife said were that's awesome you know like i'm 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 glad you you told me you felt comfortable to to share that with me um you know how how are you doing like we just kind of were like 
all right, great. How's your day? You know, and just it didn't feel like we had to make a big deal out of it. But then the next time that we spoke with with him, you know, he sat down with us and was telling us, and and he even said, um, he's like, so did you guys know? We're like, no, like we didn't. He goes, come on, like, yeah. And so it was like one of those things that he wanted to he wanted to address the situation, but then he's like, no, you guys, you guys should have known. Like, come on. Uh, and it, and once that was was out, then we were like, okay, he's comfortable with us talking about it, and we did, and we laughed about it, and. But it wasn't our place to cross that threshold and say those things until Gross. we knew the the situation and his comfort level, and and actually, you know, I being in theater, you know, a lot of of gay people. It mm-hmm. just happens. Um, but he, but he was actually the first person that I had known who um, came out to me, and so it was kind of an interesting experience to like as knowing a lot of people ahead ahead of time to be part of that. And it was a cool moment to share with him. Um, but it brings back to the, my major point of saying like, yeah, it's, it's not your place to say that. Oh yeah, we knew like, Oh duh. Like, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Because then it lessens the impact of it. And for them, it's a very important moment. Yes. So very much so. It's, it's a very important moment. And any, and, and they, they touch on this very briefly in the earlier points of the movie that, you know, why is it that gay people are the only ones that have to come out? You know, and and when I mean gay people, I mean anybody in the LGBT mm-hmm. community, non-straight. Um, yes, the the non-heterosexuals. Mm-hmm. Um, why is it that we're the only ones that have to come out? And they they do this little montage of our um, three um, our three friends coming out to their parents, yeah. and they actually they have a little they add, tease this in the in the trailer, and they have um, Abby's mom go. Abby's mom was the best. <laughs> she was the best. Oh Jesus God! She starts to cry like in. It was, it, it, was, it was like a dream. It wasn't real. No, it wasn't it was a real like, sequence. It was like, what would happen if we did this? Correct. And people reacted to people being straight the same way some parents react to some of their kids yeah. being gay. And, and it, I, I like that. It was those reactions, and you, you kind of think about it. It really makes you think, why is it that way? Uh-huh. You know, it. it's one of those things that more people should have to do this. You know, why is it just our community? Yeah. Why are we the ones that have to say it? You know? Well, it's this like, idea that... that heterosexuality is the the normal the thing, norm you know and so and i think i don't i honestly think that we can say it all we want but i don't think our society will ever get to the point where you know it's oh straight people have to come out yeah. but i think that we are getting closer and closer to it not having to necessarily be a coming out um I don't know if we'll ever get to that point in our lifetime. I'd love it. I'd love to if see we it. could get there, but I think our society, in some pockets, is definitely more um, accepting of it, where you don't feel like the person has to; they can just be themselves, mm-hmm. and it doesn't have to be like a "Hey, I'm gay" or "Hey, I'm bi" or whatever it may be. Um, but I mean, I think it's one of those things that we can we can hope as much as we want. And hopefully, we, we, our society, I think, is getting closer to it in yes. some places, and in others. Not so Not much. Not so much. But here, you know, in America, it's really... We're talking about a movie that deals with someone coming out of the closet. Like, that is so progressive. And it really shows how far, in, in, just in the last 30 years, how much the LGBT um, community has come to the forefront. You know, with this movie. And, you know, you see more um, gay people on television. Granted, it, it, in... You know, pop culture, it causes some controversy. Mm-hmm. Look at the, this whole um, Frozen controversy of yeah. Elsa being gay in a Disney movie. The whole LeFou being gay in the Beauty mm-hmm. and the Beast remake. It, you know, it causes things, it causes issues, but it's because our community is so progressive and it's fighting for its its stake in, in especially in pop culture. Yeah. You know, it's, it's fighting for it and it's grown so much. It's no longer this underground thing. You've got television shows like... RuPaul's Drag Race that is winning Emmys left and right for for its show and what it does and it you know catapults these um, these drag queens into their these amazing careers and well I think we're just in a time in where it's not necessarily getting attention just for being about the gay community it's getting attention because it's good yes um, like Call Me by Your Name which I still need to see but the amount of attention that that got at the Oscars. Um, you know, got, it, it won some awards and it won a lot of awards at the Golden Globes. Um, it's getting a lot of the attention, whereas it almost felt like, and I'm not discrediting the performance, but 
you know, were five, six, seven years ago where um, Sean Penn won the Best Actor for Harvey Milk, mm-hmm. it almost felt like he won it because he was performing it as a gay man. And, you know, and the character was yeah. gay. And his performance was very well done. Very well done. But if a musical like, for instance, Rent came out today, it wouldn't be as big of a deal that no. it involved gay characters. But when it came out, it got a lot of the attention for talking about those things. Yeah, it... And that does say that as a society, we have become more progressive that things are not getting attention solely for having that in, but it's just becoming part of, slowly but surely, little by little, it's almost just becoming part of normal pop culture and film and movies and, and just society in general. Yeah, absolutely. I'd agree with that 100%. All right, well, we went on our little tangent. It's yeah. an important part of the movie. I think it, it deserves a, that attention. Uh, but now we kind of move on to the football game, which I'm not sure. Was it the homecoming game? It was a homecoming game. Okay. It felt like it, but then like the timeline was kind of weird. Very in this movie. late because in... It seemed know, like November. It, it, was, well, it was after Halloween and yeah. before Christmas, so that makes it November-ish. <laughs> um, because, yeah, they talk about the Hanukkah is still a month away. Yeah. Blue has that. So the timeline's weird. It's very, it's very weird because, you know, here in Ohio land, um, homecoming, I know, uh, homecoming is in early October. You know, sometimes even September. Sometimes like depending on the school, but you know, it. I think it was just how they wanted to storyboard this and yeah. where they wanted to put this in. Which, which I mean, that's fine. Um, but it was, um, yeah. So we're at the homecoming game, um, and we see this is a, a climactic moment in this movie. There's For a many of characters, them. Many like many a characters. lot of character shift in yes. plot in this. This and it's not. The scene's not that long. I mean, it doesn't feel important until you look at what actually happens and how each character kind of, like, shifts their ground. Mm-hmm. Um, we get Lyle, Martin, Abby, uh, Leah, Nick, and Simon. Yes. All of our main characters to this point um, are, are involved. Mm-hmm. Everybody's involved at this point, and it's, um, it's a big moment to me. So we, we we first come up, and it's a, and it, it starts out with a fairly interesting short little conversation between Abby and Simon. Which I love. Which I is, love this part. It's cool, because it's... you don't think about it until you actually think about it. Mm-hmm. Abby sees the quarterback, or one of the football players on there, the high school team, and goes, oh, he's looking good in those, you know, nice in those pants. And he's like, we can talk about it like this now. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of interesting, because it's not that, you don't just flip a switch and you say like, okay, I'm gay. All right, now I can be gay. And yeah, like, now I can talk to you about how good this guy looks like, in, in his pants, which, I mean, come on. but <laughs> <laughs> You want to be able to, but you it's wa- just... You want to be able to, you but... You haven't done it, so no. it's not like... It's like learning to walk. You've got to kind of pace yourself. Yeah, and she goes, you know, oh, he's looking fine. And she's, re- <laughs> and she's actually trying to be supportive and yes. very helpful of it. Say, you know, say it this way. You know, he's looking fine, and he says it, and it's just so it's, awkward. It's so uncomfortable. And he even brings attention to it, and he's like, no, it's not working. No, we're not <laughs> We're not doing this. But then, And then we transition into um, the kind of running into um, into Lyle yeah. at this moment. So she, Abby really tries to hype him up to say, go talk to him. Mm-hmm. Go talk to him. So they do. They they meet up, and you know, he's like, I'm only, I only come for the coffee. Co- what did he say? Coffee and camaraderie, which I was just yeah. like, oh, uh, God. Cappuccinos. Cappuccinos and, and camaraderie. camaraderie, yes. And then you had the look on his face of like, what the hell did I just say? Yes. Um, so at this point they talk and, you know, you can see Simon really trying to say, trying to, to bring it out and almost ask him, you know, is this you? Are you blue? And Lyle turns around and asks, you know, is Abby seeing anyone? Yeah. Is she single? And this is the moment where you learn... He's straight. And there's He's, number three. There's number three. Third character interested in, who's Abby. interested in Abby. So to me, this moment, oh, this moment, this is life mm-hmm. um, as a gay man. And when you think that you are interested in someone, you find someone that you like and you kind of, you think you're connecting with, and then they turn around and they're like, yeah, I'm completely straight. I'm not interested in you at all. And, and that's, you know, to me, that's always been a struggle of, you know, of the dating scene. It's, all right, not only do you have to worry about if they're just even interested, it's like, are they even gay at all? Yeah. You know, then that's a huge thing, especially in the circles that I run in. You know, you don't know. God, in theater, you don't know half the time. <laughs> no. No, and that's the thing. is like theater, you know, and, and little tangent here is everybody makes this, there's a societal um, stereotype that people who are in theater are either... Um, overly confident women um, or gay guys. Mm-hmm. 
And as a straight man, I'd like to tell you all right now, that's not the case. <laughs> this is not um, the case at you know, all. We, we actually, you know, there are some shows that I've been in where there's like one or two straight guys and the rest are gay. Mm-hmm. And then you've also been in shows where there's one or two gay guys, yep. you know, or if any. Um, and so, yeah, you never know. Um, and you can have a conversation with somebody and be like, oh, yeah, yeah I okay maybe yeah yeah you, know, you wouldn't be like like abby you wouldn't be surprised you're not making any assumptions but you wouldn't you wouldn't be surprised and then it comes out as like oh they're not gay at all okay but and then again you're not surprised there but i can completely see where you're coming yeah from. and it's 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 a constant struggle and to see that moment i was like yes thank you for showing that moment because god does it happen and it's not just men it's women too mm-hmm. constantly 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 Oof. so uh, clearly Simon is upset because now the second guy that he's been into is straight and he, it feels like he was led on and he's upset and Martin comes up, mm-hmm. which there was that, this small joke, um, that I thought was, it was tacky, but funny where he takes off his head. Um, he's like, I'm the bear. I thought you'd be into that. I was like, oh, Martin. Yeah, he goes, like, I, th- I, th- I thought you were into bears. Well, when he said the line, he still has the, the, that's hat, right. he does. the, head, on, the head on. And Simon's like, what? And he takes um, he takes the, the bear head off. He's like, it's just me. It's just me. Of course it's you. Of course it is. Because, you know, that's how it would. But, yeah, that moment, ooh, that would be scary. Yeah. And and so he's, 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 upset, he's upset. And basically Martin's throwing out this idea like, you know, I... What should, I, what should I do? What you know, and continually pestering Simon about what he should do with Abby, and at this point he doesn't care anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, he's he's so frustrated, and it's another one of those things is we see this happen now twice in a row where Simon finds out the guy that he's interested in isn't gay, and then Martin shows up. Yep. And then this after the second time he's fr- he's just like screw it. He's like go big or go home. Like do whatever you got to do. I don't care. See you later. Um, which is probably bad advice because Martin makes this huge big gesture, runs out on the field during the national anthem, um, to which I love the, the vice principal's reactions throughout this whole scene. He's like, why are we interrupting the, the national anthem? And no one's upset about it. Um, but he, he makes this huge gesture and tells Abby, hey, you know, you transferred into our school and into my heart. And you're just like rolling your eyes at the whole thing. Um, but he, he does. He, he's very open. He, he kind of opens his heart. And um, Abby, in a very kind way, you know, says, I'm sorry, I'm just not into you that way. And it's like the exact same moment is then shown again yes. more publicly that we just saw with Simon and Lyle. Yeah. And it's it's interesting. It's very interesting. And I liked the way that they had Abby deal with that situation. Like you see her during this whole cringeworthy moment and it is cringeworthy. Mm-hmm. Um, she's just like slumping down and her shoulders are slumped and she's obviously very uncomfortable. But... She just gets up, goes down to the edge of the um, the stadium, and talks to him. He's still holding onto the microphone, mind you. So it's like it's down by his stomach, so you can still hear what he says. But she's very polite about it. Most people would just run away from that situation. Mm-hmm. And that that's way. what you normally stereotypically see in these yeah. types of movies. The person's like, oh, no, I'm sorry, and then they run. Like, no, she says it. Walks back to her seat, sits down, and it's like... They watch the rest of the game. Okay. Like, in the whole entire school, because it's the homecoming game, and I think that's why they emphasize it so much that it was the homecoming game. Bigger. Um, to everybody in the school saw it, people are filming it, and, you know, this is also the second um, point of Simon trying to derail somebody from coming after Abby. He gets um, Leah and Nick to go out to dinner together mm-hmm. before the game, because Nick is still very much interested in Abby, and he, you know, mm-hmm. goes to him and says, you know, I think I'm just going to do it. I'm going to go for it. Um, and he says, no, Leah's in love with you, or something like that. Yeah, and, well, because he actually does think that Leah is into yeah, him. he really does. He thinks that that's who she was talking about the night after the Halloween party. Correct. So, so. yeah, you, you see that you've got, now all of our main characters are involved with this, and and he, he walks away very embarrassed. And the next thing that we see is um, it kind of transitions into uh, on the website. We see a lot of these like memes and videos being posted about Martin. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can tell that 
it's not going to end well just because you have somebody who opened their, themselves up in front of everyone, made a big gesture, and it went south for them. Um, Timeline-wise, we transition pretty quickly into like Christmas time. Mm-hmm. It's like uh, We get an email from Blue that says that he's going to be going to the middle of nowhere so he won't have cell service and everything like that. And this is where we get our third potential Blue, which yes. is Cal, who I can't remember the name, but this actor was also in... 13, uh, 13 reasons. reasons Why. Yes, he was in that mo- uh, that show too. Um, so we see him um, kind of start looking at um, at Cal because it talks about you know when the uh, when the paper cut scene happens about how he's going you know off the grid and all this kind of stuff. So during the emails with Blue, you know he talks about hey I'm going to go away with my dad uh, on this weird like fishing trip and pretending because he's kind of. Uh, Blue has kind of said, hey, I told my dad, mm-hmm. and he started the process as well, so he starts putting the pieces together, this might be Cal, and, um, and you know, as that begins, all hell kind of breaks loose. For, yeah, it's it's a, it's a downward rush after this that slows down at, at a moment uh, that we needed to slow down at, but for the most part, you know, this kind of wraps up the movie fairly quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Christmas Eve happens, um, and things are going really well. Um, he has messaged uh, a he's, he's sent a list of, of Christmas songs to Blue to say, "Hey, here's going to get you through." And he's thinking it's Cal, and he's starting to kind of fall for Cal as this image of who Blue is. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of a sudden, he gets another FaceTime request. Um, Leah says, "You need to check out this website." Um, and he goes and he sees that Martin has completely just blasted everything out there posted all the screenshots um in a very you know derogatory way has outed him as gay you know saying like um, guys looking for butt stuff apply girls need not apply all this and he gets very really hateful. derogatory very hateful yeah and it that's where it's like oh no it's out there yeah and it's like, it, it's like a bad it's like a bad dream it's like a nightmare yeah so the whole um the whole outing it was almost a kind of a revenge thing because simon had told martin to go for it Mm -hmm. because you know he thinks all right if i do this huge gesture abby's gonna say yes and um you know simon does try to reach out to martin before the whole outing and says hey i just want to make sure you're okay just let me know because you kind of think for a second oh god what if he does something that drastic yeah um but he doesn't and thank goodness and um we have this outing and you just you see simon be almost destroyed to a level he breaks down because this this post you know martin does it anonymously yes and he posts it as anonymous as you know he's gay and you know talks about you know um let's focus on this essentially versus you know what happened with martin which was still pretty epic so you can they can probably tell that was him that posted it but just you see this level of destruction in his soul his world as he knows it has come to an end Mm -hmm. because he writes earlier in the movie in one of his uh emails to blue and says i want to hold on to myself for a little bit longer and I'm going to go to the happy moment real quick before we got oh, real dark was, inside. This was so talking about hilarious. waiting until after graduation, waiting until he goes to college, and it breaks into this transition. Uh, Whitney Houston's "I Want to Dance with Somebody," which is a, an essential gay theme, and it flashes to Simon at college putting up all these posters of Whitney and of uh, is it Pete Wentz? The I, no, I don't remember. I know I saw there were a couple drag queens on there. There was a couple drag queens. Whoever the lead singer of Panic at the Disco is, because they hit they on it earlier that him, that's yeah. how he knew um, that Simon knew he was gay. But all these posters, and then you get this full on like La La Land movie musical dance sequence mm-hmm. to I Want to Dance with Somebody. Everybody's in a bright rainbow colored shirt, and Simon is just in like this gray. And he walks out of his dorm, down through the building, and out um, out into the front quad, I guess. And it's just this full, overly flamboyantly gay dance sequence, which I was living for. I, I thought, thought it was, was freaking hilarious. I'm like, hmm. Just, it just, it's really playing to that gay audience. Like, yes, we love our gay musicals. <laughs> yes, we love a good dance break. But it was so 
random and hilarious. Oh, it was. It it doesn't fit into this movie, and I think that's why I like it so much. Is because they went to that place of, and then he even ends. He's like, okay, maybe not that gay. Yes. Like, and it's it's showing you he's not even sure how gay he is. Like he's he's kind of questioning and. You know, at that moment, he's thinking there's like levels of like mm-hmm. I can be this or this, and he doesn't really know, but he just knows, you know, that he's fallen into this category. And um, I just I'd love that because we did we did skip over that, and I was laughing the whole time just because I, it was it was, it was hilarious. It was so fantastic. But this poor this poor guy, he is essentially seeing his world begin to crumble around him. His and friends, his sister too, comes yeah. in, and it's like I've reported it. They're gonna take it down, and he's like, "It's the same concept of like it doesn't it doesn't matter. It's there. It's there. People have seen it. It's over." Yeah, and you f- like I loved her. This actress, yeah, um, she. I've seen her in a couple things. She's not been um, in a ton, um, but she the 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 character's name is Nora. Um, it's Talitha Bateman. Yeah, and. I'm curious as if she's she can't be the the her older sister Leah Bateman. Um, she was in let's see oh I, that's where she's from Geostorm. Um, I'd seen her in Geostorm. She was the the younger um, the daughter. She's been in just a handful of things, but um, has not really done a lot. She was in the Fifth Wave. If you've seen that, um, that seems like yeah. There's a lot of movies that I'm she looking was in at right Annabelle now. Annabelle movie too, which was. But she's she's definitely got a place. Um, she's a very strong actress. But she um, she comes in as as the sister and is like, you know, you could deny it. Like she's trying to help, and she she's trying to make it better for him because she knows that he's hurting and she knows that this is an awkward, uncomfortable situation. Um, and he he reacts very much like you would expect someone to react. Like he's lashing out at her. He's mad that. Mm-hmm. He's mad that it got posted. He's not mad at her. No. Um, but she runs out crying, and she doesn't know what to do. And then he uh, he falls into this just emotional spiral. Yeah. Um, so his friends are trying to reach out. They text him, and all and they, you know, he hangs up on um, on Leah very abruptly, and they're just like, you, you see him break down, and it's one of those moments that you just. It hits you right in the heart because you can see the devastation on his face mm-hmm. and what he's gonna have to experience, and it almost it essentially forces him into having to come out um, to to his family, and that's kind of where we go next, isn't it? Yeah, we we go to Christmas morning because it's yeah. Christmas Eve. Christmas morning, they're opening gifts, um, and he decides to tell his parents. Um, and immediately you get a split reaction. You see, the dad is actually plays it as because uh, he they can tell that he's trying to tell them something, and the dad goes, you're, "You got someone pregnant." Yeah. Or oh, you're pregnant. Like he, the dad's just one. Everybody knows it, it, it could have been their own parent, their own father, or you know, a friend's father, but somebody who makes light of situations um, just because they they can't deal with anything emotional, so they just. Mm-hmm. Never, like, they're not deflecting, that's just, that's them. Yeah, it's a and coping the, mechanism. Yeah, and the dad the dad seems almost very upset with it. Um, the mom seems very um, okay with it. She's very, you know, um, comforting and open about it. Um, and But he deflects, he, Simon himself deflects by, like, saying, like, oh, let's open a present. And he, like, he's like, all right, I told you, let's, let's move on. Try to run on. And there's a moment, um, the dad, Josh Tamel, gets up. And he walks away. Mm-hmm. And to me, that was a very relative moment to my story. Um, I remember the night I told my dad, he got up and walked out of the room. Mostly because he didn't know how to process. Mm-hmm. But it's almost, you think that, his, that the dad character is going to reject reject him. Because we... We have this moment. Mm-hmm. We don't see that full circle until the end on how his reaction actually is, whether that is acceptance or whether it is, um, you know, whether it's denial. So it's a very, it's a very big moment to me, and I don't think a lot of people will see it that way. They just see it as, oh, he needs to go get some air and breathe because his son just came out. Mm-hmm. It, that to me, that's a tell. Like, oh, he is rejecting this. He's yeah, gonna he's running away from the situation. He doesn't exactly. want to talk about it. Doesn't want to do it. And he doesn't want to continue it. Yeah. It was it was a big moment for me. 
And I, I, I liked that because there's the line, and we'll talk about how it comes out again later, but um, the first thing Simon says after he says I'm gay is, I'm still me, um, but I, you know, like, and he just, he, he kind of like just talks a little bit more, but that's the two lines that are important in this scene, at least that he says is, I'm gay, I'm still me. me. Um, and that's something too that we'll we'll talk about here in a little bit when he comes and talks to his mom because that's a real that that scene that conversation with his mom. Ooh, is, we'll get to that. That's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. Um, and so after this, you know, we we got to remember he's been on a two week break. He's been over on Christmas vacation, and now he has to go back to school. Yep. Goes back to school and goes to pick up his friends, and they're all sitting standing on the corner. Which normally he goes picks up Nick. Backs up, picks up uh, Leah, and then goes over to, to Abby's house. Mm-hmm. But this time they're all there. So he parks his car, goes out and talks. And this is kind of where we, we had referred to earlier about the friends making it about them. Um, the first thing Abby and Nick say is, um, you know, we, we got together over, you know, at, at, on New Year's Eve. And, Nick, and Simon's like, that's great. And he's like, yeah, it is. It should have happened sooner, but that thanks to you, it didn't. And like they immediately just like turn they, it on him. They attack him. They do. And and even Leah says, you know, I wasn't talking about Nick. I was talking about you. And I can deal with you being gay and me not being able to be with you because of that. I can't deal with you setting me up for heartbreak, which he did. He definitely did. And he he explains to them like I was being blackmailed. I didn't. I was worried. I didn't know what to do. Um, and this was my way of protecting myself, and they they don't care. That's they that's not that important to them at all. So you you see him, and again, there's the the foundations of his life that he explains in the first ten minutes are crumbling, yeah. losing his friends. Um, he's he's lashed out at his sister, his mom and dad. His dad apparently at this point in time has a reaction of we're not sure, but like you said, um, insinuates that he's not dealing well with it, um, and he no longer has anything really going for him on top of this he sends a message to blue of -hmm. saying you've you've probably been gone you're going to see some things um but i want you to know like i need you to stick around and i really hope you won't um like you won't leave he's like i think don't leave you don't disappear disappear yep um and blue's response to that is you know i saw it i saw the posts i i can't deal with this you know, and, and essentially, then the last thread that he had of some form of support, the person that he has fallen in love with at this point is now rejecting him. Yeah. So his entire support system from his family to his best friends now to this, you know, this f- figment of his imagination, they're all gone. He's alone. Yeah. He has just had to go through the biggest thing so far in his life alone. Mm-hmm. He has no one right now to talk to. And Blue deletes his email account because his response is, it says, uh, message uh, failure so permanently. permanently. And like, they zoom in on permanently. Yeah. So that just affirms he's gone. He's, he is Blue out of the is picture. A, is completely gone. So we have this uh, this question of who Blue is. Um he goes to school and you see everybody reacting because it's the first time he's been at school after this was sent. Um, it seems kind of uh, almost humorous or awkward, but the principal, the vice principal is wearing a, a pride flag pin. To me, I kind of see this as, as a teacher, that is a way of saying, like, I, I know things are rough right now. I'm here. And he doesn't make a huge. He does a little bit where he, he says does a little bit where he's like, I, "I said I saw myself, uh, you know, in you. Like we were, we were really alike. I, I wanted you to know that I'm not like I'm not gay. It's like one of those. Which that was awkward. But the fact that he was wearing the pin, I thought was kind of a, a very nice gesture as being an educator of saying yeah. like, "I'm supporting you." He goes a little beyond that, and of course, is well, you know, being humorous, but that's part of his character. Yeah. Um, but we also, when we're back at school, we see. Um, everybody giving him the look. Um, we see that, you know, people are talking about him because he's the, you know, the big news that happened over Mm -hmm. break and it's a big deal. Um, but we have this scene in the lunchroom where the two bullies who'd been picking on the Ethan character run in dressed up in outfits that resemble both Ethan and Simon and are just derogatorily making this skit up about them two being into each other and, um, 
like Ethan, the Ethan um, bully is spanking the Simon ca- character's yeah, it's, bully. It's and very derogatory. Just very making just, a big deal. Uh, uh, very offensive. Mm-hmm. Very belligerent, and they just don't care. And that Simon's reaction to me is not again the norm. It isn't. You would not see someone like that. He stands up, charges at these two, and says, do you have something you want to say to me? And calls them out on it. You don't see that. And I really enjoyed the fact that they made him stronger. Yeah. And he, because any other time, you would have seen him just run and go hide in a bathroom stall. Or run and leave school. But this moment, he stands up. And at this point, this is where we get the theater teacher back in. This is where she goes on the defensive. And... She just lets these two have it. Yeah. You know, sw- you know, calls them out, calls them idiots, call, you know, just everything. Takes them to the to the uh, vice principal's office and <laughs> and just gets a, probably gets them suspended. We don't know what actually happens to them, but she calls them out and it's it's comical just because, you know, it's kind of, she the theater teacher's kind of like the sassy yeah. black woman. It's kind of the character yeah. that she has, but she is defending what um, defending Simon and defe- defending Ethan as well, and which, it's, which it's, I'm glad to see that in a school setting. Yeah, you usually see that happen, and then the teachers don't do anything about it. It's the, the students who have to do something in you know revenge or, or whatever it is that they get back at the bullies yeah. themselves. Uh, which yeah, I loved that she came up and said like she said, "No, you you two are assholes who are." Um, making fun of people for being themselves. Mm-hmm. And they're like, you can't talk about, you can't say those things to us. She's like, yeah, I can. Um, and and no one is going to be upset because no one likes those type of people. Yeah. Um, and she calls them out. And that's one of those things that we, we don't see very often. Or if we do, we see it in more of like a grab them by the collar and run them off to the principal. Like you don't just tell, we never see it in movies where people tell them how it is. Whenever... You know, I, I, I try to as often as possible as a teacher when I see someone saying something ignorant, uh, just to be like, that's no, like just kind of squashing it. But the way she says it is the way that teachers who feel that way want to say it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you don't always have the liberties to call your students assholes. No. Um, you know, no, however much some of them may, may <laughs> deserve it, you just don't do it. No. You let somebody else do it for you. Uh, but she she does stand up in a way that I think was appropriate, as well as the vice principal telling them like we need to we're tolerant. Yeah, um, what's what's the number one rule or something at this school? Yeah. And it's and it's tolerance. And this kind of leads us into this this conversation with Ethan, um, where mm-hmm. I think is, a, is another important discussion because we had talked about how Ethan's character seemed very confident, very stereotypical um, characteristics of a, of a gay man, but. Also, at the same time, you know, very confident mm-hmm. and um, in his own skin and his identity. And Simon mentions this of like, you know, you you've known since you were sixteen, and you know, you make it seem so easy. And he's like, no, it's not easy. It's not even no matter how much it may seem, you don't see everything that yeah, happens. You don't know the background. He goes into how his mom um, talks to his uh, his grandparents every Sunday at dinner. You know about all the girls he's dating and all this stuff. Which, in reality, does happen. And, you know, you see um, Ethan really open up about his struggles and what he's going through. And you mm-hmm. see the difference in their characters. Because so many people, and they kind of um, uh, play on this um, just after this conversation between the two of them with the bullies. About just because they're gay doesn't automatically make them interested in each other. Yeah, he, he says that, you know, you're... Um, your all hoodie wardrobe isn't really my style. Yeah, <laughs> which I enjoyed. But, and, and it's the truth that just because two people are gay, it doesn't mean they're automatically interested in each other. You like, wouldn't say it about two straight people. Exactly. Just, oh, you're straight, I'm straight. Oh, we must yeah, be dating. I dealt with that in college. <laughs> I had some, I had a friend of mine in college who thought that way. Very small town mindset. Mm-hmm. Thought, you know, oh, you're gay, he's gay. Why don't you guys date? I am not interested in the person at all. Why not? They're gay. That doesn't. That's not the end all, be all. Yeah. So I would. I enjoyed that moment because it was. It was a moment of truth, and it allowed um, Ethan to learn something more about um, about his community that he is now officially a part of. Mm-hmm. You know that there are different types of people, and yeah. people go through these different struggles. Some of the same struggles that he's dealing with. 
So now he's learning a support system of people that um, he saw in a different light. And this leads us into one, the, the first of, I mean, essentially four conversations that really sum up the, the entire movie um, yeah. as far as the journey of coming out. <clears throat> we start with the conversation that Simon has um, with Martin, who's, who's outside the school, um, trying to apologize. Yeah. And it, it ends, I mean, it's not a very long conversation. It's more of a, a rant, uh, an angry uh, yelling from Simon to Martin um, about Martin taking away his, his like, right to choose when and where and how he comes out. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, we never see Martin's reaction to this. And I think that it's important that we don't see, like, how he reacts. It doesn't matter how he no. reacts. It's not, um, it doesn't matter at all. It's we see the, the camera goes immediately to Simon after he does this and has this conversation with him, and then goes to his car and the anger and frustration that he has because he knows that it was taken away from him. The this idea of when he, you know you took away my opportunity to decide when, where, and how mm-hmm. I was to come out. Yeah, and it's just it's it's taking away it takes away so much from him from Simon and it you see him lash out in a way that we have not seen Simon lash out at any character or speak um the entire movie mm-hmm. um some very choice words some choice language some it's a PG-13 movie and they use the they use the one f bomb in this one f bomb yep so and it was it, it was handled in a way that i thought was respectful but also got the point across. Yeah. And very and it was a very powerful moment because you it's kind of like the stages of almost like the stages of grief. You I go you go through that. anger and then you go through denial and you go through acceptance whatever else is in between. I can't think of them right off the top of my head, but you see this is the anger aspect him just Absolutely. letting Martin have it. And the next scene we see this completely different side of what's been, of what just happened yeah um it to me the in my opinion the most emotional um moment of the entire movie for myself because you go back to you go back to those moments you go back to that conversation and when you're talking to someone especially your parents and the people that are very close to you um, I, it took me to a place of, I can't even describe it, of how emotional it was to see. Um, he sits down, he comes home from school, his mom's writing something, um, I don't, God only knows, but sits down and has this conversation about, um, acceptance, I guess, in a way, and just... I don't know. <laughs> I'm losing my train of thought because Wait, I'm starting. I'm starting to get emotional. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think the first thing Simon says is, "Did you know?" Yeah. And she says, "She says I knew you had a secret." She didn't know what the secret was, but mm-hmm. she had mentioned. She's like, over the past couple of years, you have not been the same carefree person you were as a, as a child. Like when you were a kid, you just you didn't care about anything. You were just happy all the time. And she says that you you felt like you her. She said. Uh, which is such a powerful line. She says that it. I could feel when you walked into a room that it was like you were holding your breath. Yeah, um, that was powerful. And saying like, I I didn't know what was wrong. I didn't know what it was that your secret was, or why you were holding your breath, or what that that weight on your shoulders was. But she says now you get to breathe. Now you get to be you. Um, and she says that you now you get to. Go get the things that you want. You don't have to try anymore to to placate others or put up a, a front in order to fit the, a mold. You just get to be you now. You get to be you. And that's such a huge thing for anybody who is dealing with this acceptance level of who they are and who they love and what they're feeling. The, the ability to be free and be yourself is... It, it's impossible to put words to. The difference between how you were before you said the words I'm gay or I'm bi or I'm a lesbian, whatever it is, 
to the feelings and the experiences that you have after those words are out there, they're in the universe, is indescribable. Because you you get to be the person that you want to be. You don't have to work so hard to put on this front of, oh, I'm straight. I want everybody to know that I like that I like girls or I like boys, whatever. You don't have to hide anymore. And it's just a level of comfort that, you know, not everybody understands unless you've gone through this this journey of the acceptance not only of your sexuality but of yourself Mm -hmm. you have to be able to accept yourself and who you are and unfortunately so many young people in this day and age don't accept themselves and that is why we see so many of these people take their own lives and they go through all of these emotional things by themselves because they're too scared of what somebody on the other side is going to say once those words are in the universe. And to see him have this conversation with his mom, who, yes, we've established is very liberal, Mm -hmm. very progressive, knows what's going on in the world, but just to show her love for her son was so powerful to me. And because I know... My mom was the person that I came out to and it was a, it was an emotional moment that I don't know that I could ever share with anybody else ever again, just because it, it, it's so personal and the feeling of knowing that she cared that she didn't, I should say that she didn't care. She said, I still love you no matter what you're still my son because that's what you pray to God that you hear on the other side of that. And so many people don't get to hear that. And it breaks my heart to, to know that people have to deal with that. And I was very proud of this movie for taking it in that direction. Yeah. And it's, it's important to know too, is as she walks away, um, the, the mom goes up and gives him a kiss and walks away and, um, she doesn't let him like r- kind of ruminate on it. He, he, she wants, I think that the, the brevity of this conversation shows that she wants him to know that there are important things to think about and she wants to say them and she wants him to think about them, but she doesn't want to make a big deal about it because yeah. it's, it's not like a life changing thing, you know, in a, in the sense of we have to change everything now. It's right. We know and okay, great, you know, we're going to move on. I have to tell you these things. I want you to think about these things. And as she says, she does, we, we mentioned that the, when he comes out to the parents, he says, I'm gay, and I, but I'm still me. And she's like, but I want you to hear that too. Yeah. You know, you've said I it, love that. but I want you to hear it. And, you know, and that, that, gives, that conversation gives him confidence moving forward through the rest of the movie that I don't know if he'd be able to without having that conversation. I don't think you so. Know, he would probably sit in this kind of middle ground of a couple people being okay with it, but a lot of people not, um, and not necessarily questioning if he sh- if he should be, um, or not 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 coming out because he didn't have the choice. But um, if if he, if he could have done something different or. He, he accepts what is, and then after this conversation goes and meets up with Leah, um, and this is where he he talks to her. Um, we find out that she she was more upset that he didn't come out to her yeah. first, as opposed to Abby, um, which we never really said why. But he felt that Abby he'd known for three months, six months, um, when and he'd known Leah for thirteen years, and. He didn't want what he had with Leah to change. Mm-hmm. You know, the best friend who he didn't want to lose as a result of life changing. Because he always talks about that throughout the movie. He doesn't want things to change. He wants just to be able to tell people, but he's worried as soon as he tells people, then they're going to see him differently and mm-hmm. life is going to be different. He doesn't want, he wants things to be the same. Um, and so I heard, and I, the one line I really enjoyed, it's, it's almost a little crude, but she says, you know, tell me about this boy. Tell me about him. And he, she's like, you sure? And she's like, yep, I need to kill heterosexual Simon. Yep. You know, and I think that for some, for the situation that she was in, being in love with him, 
it was fine to think that way because she's like, I need to know that that's not the, the person that I saw you as is not the mm-hmm. person who you are. And she's okay with that person fading away as far as that aspect of him and moving forward with it. And he's like, no, don't, you don't need to do that. And he's like, she's like, no, I already took a machete to yeah. most of him. I need to finish it off. <laughs> and it's like, in a way it's, it's kind of saying things are different, but only in this way. And I want you to be able to tell, talk to me. And this is the first thing we need to talk about for both you and for me, because like you'd mentioned, it doesn't just impact the person. It that's an important part of it, and it's probably the, and it is by far the most important part of it. But it does have effects on yeah. those around you, you know, friends and family. And this was one of the loose ends of the movie that needed to be wrapped up. Yeah, you know, as far as like how is she going to react exactly. to this ultimately? Yeah, she was a character that was very invested in him, and to see. Her come to a level, again, of acceptance and the idea of, okay, can she move on from seeing him as this idolized, I'm in love with you, versus, okay, he is now, um, I know 100% that he's not interested in me. So, how is she going to react? So, I thought that was a, I thought that was an interesting scene. Um, very, uh, it, it was a little crude with the, with the machete thing, but I yeah. thought it was, I thought it was very... Very good, because, you know, we we saw earlier everybody leave him. Now we see these people coming back around him to bring him back yeah. up. Which leads us to the final of the conversations with with the important people in his life, which is the one with the dad. Um, and he comes after after his, his conversation with Leah, he comes walking back, and the dad's um, working on, I think it's Christmas lights, or he's working on something out in the, in the, the driveway. And he tells Simon to come over. And he starts saying, he's like, how, when did you know? And he said, you know, how old were you when you knew, when you found, when you figured it out? And he said he was 13. And his reaction immediately is four years. Um, he's like, for four years, um, and, and you aren't really sure where he's going to go with it. Yeah. At first you're like, you know, like, almost, you could almost see him being mad that you went four years without telling us. Um, but he very quickly changes it and he says, four years, I should have seen it. And... Simon's like, no, you know, don't worry about it. Like, no, you, you shouldn't. Have. Don't worry about that. And he's like, no, all the jokes, all the things I said that were, it's like a father who's coming to terms with his ignorance and being ashamed of it. Yeah, it was a, it was interesting because you thought that he was going to be, and we said, four years. You know, you think four years and you could, you, you didn't say anything, or four years, I missed it, I didn't see it. You know, he was apologetic. Mm-hmm. He said, I'm sorry for the for those crude jokes. You, you know. Because you saw it in, um, with the, uh, um, are you pregnant or do you yeah. get somebody pregnant when he comes out? But it was, it was interesting to have him apologize. Yeah, I was taken back by it and saw it in a different light. Like, oh, he's okay with this. He gets it, and he's sorry for the way he's acted. That was, that was a moment. Yeah, you don't, you do not see that very often. Um, which it kind of shows us that things work out for him with his family. And like you had said, that's not always the case. Right. Um, I think for the message that this movie was trying to get across, it needed to be the case because it is an uplifting. Things can end okay. Um, you know, there, we we hear enough of the stories of things not going well that we don't need another. We don't we don't need a drama. This movie was meant to be uplifting, and yeah. that's the scenario that needed to play out for it to have that ultimate outcome. But this uplifting atmosphere that happens then gives Simon the confidence to send out an email, uh, or not an email, but a post, post. on this, this website um, saying, you know, okay, um, I'm reaching out to everybody. If you have um, been anywhere near a computer or a phone, you know that this, but it is true. I mean, he, it's his kind of slightly altered way of coming out, this mm-hmm. letter. Um, but then he, he kind of messages the student body with blue in mind saying, I deserve this. Um, I deserve my love, my happy love story, and so do you. You know where I'll be, and he doesn't even say anything. He just says, "You'll know where I'll be after mm-hmm. cabaret, like ten o'clock um, tonight or Friday night or something like that." And this is where, and then he signs it, "Love Simon." And you and I both like leaned over, to, like they said they it. They said it. It's that moment it's when that. they say the title yeah. of the movie you know, in the in the actual movie, and you're like, "Oh, so." <laughs> Which I, I I always love that every every time. Peter Griffin, I'll never, I'll <laughs> never ever forget, you know, that, that episode. That little, episode yeah. So every time someone says the the title of the movie, I have that reaction. Um, but this is where, okay, the other 
um, English teacher analysis comes into play. So they go and they have their opening or closing night of cabaret or whatever it is. And um, I was starting to think about this and I was like, okay, theater, cabaret, could have been anything. Yeah. Why cabaret? Well, cabaret is about World War Two. And the, whole, the, the story of World War II in, in this musical is the Jews in hiding um, and this accepting the people in this cabaret. The cabaret is kind of the escape. And the connection between the Jews in hiding in World War II and the, the hiding that Simon was doing throughout the movie of trying to hide himself, yeah. ultimately saying, you know, I am who I am. The movie and the, the musical ending with, People saying, you know, it's it is what it is, and I'm I'm fighting for the rights of what I believe in. They could have picked any musical. They yeah. picked cabaret, and I think that might be why. Um, it wasn't just because you know because you look at it and there's really no they make no connection as to why this is the musical. Like it's no, just it's just it, it is what it is, and you know, looking back at it, there's a couple notes that the that the theater teacher says that it's you know there's two kids that keep making out she's, she's like it's world war Two or something like that Your nazis be angrier yeah <laughs> so i and i did not pick up on that at all and that is 100 percent dead on so my, my analysis is, is showing uh but yeah i saw that and i was like oh there's there's it was sneaky it was one of those Very like symbols sneaky, where it's because you wouldn't think about yeah. it at all and then i mean then you got the tea falling off during the yeah <laughs> during and the then club. she's like i don't get paid enough i don't for get this paid shit. enough for this and yeah oh, it's so funny so he go uh the, the the show ends um friends come back leah uh it meets in they had a really nice dressing room I wish my dressing room was that nice in high school. Right. Um, but they come back. Leah is back there in the dressing room, and Abby and Nick come back. And it's kind of like a all is forgiven. You know, we're not worried about it anymore. We forgive you. I, we hope you forgive us. And it's just like everybody's just like they know where he's going. Mm-hmm. You want to come to the festival with us? Uh, and he's like, yeah, I really do. It's like, okay. Like they accept him. They're okay with it. They're there for him. Um, and they go to this this winter festival. Um, he goes and buys, I thought this was really funny, a ton of tickets to get on the Ferris wheel. That was hilarious. Hands them to the guy, and then you see the support of not only the friends, but the community, really, of they know what he's trying to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, even to the point where Leah tells, like, a friend to put, like, she or, like, a, a bystander, put your phone away. Like, yeah. that's, that's not what that's, that's not for. what this is about. This is not another, you know, uh, homecoming game incident. Exactly. And the moment that Martin approaches... The, there were literal no's yelled in the theater because <laughs> everybody thinks that he's blue at this point. Yeah, that little, like, it's he set up that way and he runs up and he says, you know, um, Simon is on his last ticket, on his mm-hmm. last run. And Martin runs up and says, wait, um, just about, Simon's about to get off. And you're like, oh God, seriously? It would have been a big swerve. It would It would have been a big plot twist, but... You know, calls him out on it and says, it's not you. And he goes, yeah, you're right, it's not me. I just feel bad. You feel bad. And this is kind of his way of apologizing. And he says it. This is my way to apologize to you for for making you go through this. So he pays for the last, you know, pays $4 for another uh, another ride through. And he goes on another um, trip through the... Uh, through the Ferris wheel. I don't know how he's not sick or vomiting because after all those tickets, I think I would be nauseous. It would have been there for a couple hours. At yeah. Least. And there's still, I, I expected to see, you know, um, the group start to thin. You know, yeah, I thought I, so too. I, people to walk away and give up because you're on the last one. It's not going to happen. You know, the slowly you see people walk away and all that you have left are his three friends yeah. until, um, until he gets off. But, um, what happens is not what you expect. Yeah, we um, we he, they go to pin the the him in again just to you know say your last one, and um, Brom shows up and he says, "Hey, can I sit with you?" And he goes, "I'm waiting for somebody." And he says, "I know." Um, and it's like that moment where you're like, "Oh my gosh, that's you know." We talked earlier like they're not going to give away who it is in the first twenty minutes. They actually they do. did, um, and. It makes perfect sense, and he says, well, what about, you know, the Halloween party? And he's like, I was drunk. Um, I was confused. It ended right after you left. Yeah. Like, nothing happened, really. Um, 
and they go up on the Ferris wheel, and he said, like, I wasn't going to come until, like, as I was approaching you just now is when I knew I needed to. Mm-hmm. Like, he wasn't going to. He wasn't ready. He didn't feel like he was okay with it. Um, but they talk for a little bit. They get to the top of the Ferris wheel, and then it's, like, very... Ter- Awkward. Very stereotypical, like, oh, yeah. Awkward. And they kiss, and everyone's cheering, and in the theater, everyone's cheering, and I was like, okay. Like, I don't know, it, like... The, him approaching and talking was the moment I needed yes, for this I to be closure. I, I didn't, didn't need them kissing. And not, not that I was uncomfortable with it. It was like, it just felt like he didn't need that It, didn't, it didn't need it. I don't think that, I think they put it in there just to say, okay, we need to have them kiss. And I, and I made the comment, it's like half these people have never seen two men kiss before. <laughs> and they were like, oh my god, woo! Like all this cheering and stuff. It's like, it didn't need that. The, the closure of finding out that it was Brahm and them getting together and then riding the Ferris wheel. The yeah. confidence that both of them were able to, and the bravery of saying, forget about everything else. This is who we are. This is what is important to us. That is the closure for me that I felt I wrapped agree. the story around. 100%. I agree that completely. I, I thought it was just another, the kiss was just extra and it wasn't needed. But, I mean, put it in there. Why not? Yep. And I don't know if you noticed this, but as they were, so right after the kiss, they had like a pan up and I noticed that everything was blue. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was like, that's a nice little, very subtle, another subtle imagery of Mm -hmm. like blue cotton candy, blue lights. A lot of people were wearing blue. Um, And it was just like, they didn't bring any attention to it, but that was kind of, you know, what, what was there. Um, And then it kind of is like a you know, two weeks later, like a, here's how everything wraps up. Yeah. Um, and they go and they, they pick, he picks everybody up. Um, well, he goes down for breakfast, his dad and, and everybody, and it, life is normal. Again. It was just how it was in the beginning. And, and that's what he wanted to be the same as it was. Yep. And it was very much the same as it was. So he, you know, eats whatever his sister is making and he leaves, goes to start the process of picking everybody up. And then we hit the coffee shop, and he makes a point to say we drink a lot of iced coffee. We see this pan or this this shot of the um, is a drive through coffee shop mm-hmm. of the barista handing a tray of coffees over to Simon. We see it three times. We see it three times. The first time is um, there's four coffees in the tray, so one for each of them, and they make a note that Abby like uh, Nick makes a comment. Abby likes uh, milk in her coffee. Okay, whatever. The second time is after all of this has gone down and Simon's alone. He gets one coffee. Mm-hmm. Now we're seeing it the third time, and then there's five coffees. So you know what's about to happen. Yeah. So because it it was always pick um, pick all three of them up, go get coffee, go to school. Yep. So now their routine has changed. Pick all three of them up, go get coffee, and then they go pick up Rom. And yeah. they make this cute moment of Leah resigns, kind of her seat in the um, the front seat yep. goes sits in the back and Brom gets in up front they kiss um gives him or gives him coffee first yep. and then kisses him and then he's like it's such a good day it's such a beautiful day out we're gonna take a we're gonna go on an adventure and I'm like that was a weird really cheesy last line yeah I didn't get it I don't know why yeah, they because said it. that's exactly what I need I was like, yeah uh, why it was just... it was a very weird ending I would have just liked to see like him get in the car and then like drive up to the school, drive up to school. be done with it yeah like I don't know it felt it was a weird ending, um, as far as as the like it panned up and it was like oh they're gonna go in the city and have a good time. I was like, is it, that's not normal life though. Normal yeah. life is you go to school. I don't know. That was kind of a, an, a weird ending. I don't know if I liked it, but I didn't like it. I know I didn't. But that's it. And then we get our end credits. Um, so kind of big picture is you know we've talked about it a lot through, but how do you feel that this movie? Um, the question that we went in with it is, is how is it going to represent the story and the feelings and the ideas of um, a gay man, gay teenager coming out? How do you think it represented it? I think it represented it fairly accurately. Uh, there was a lot of sunshine and rainbows added in that you don't see. And we we hinted, we hit on it about how there's so much negativity around this in the world. It was nice to see it put in a positive light, in an in, in empowering light. Mm-hmm. Um, but I thought, you know, the the description of how how does it feel, what do you go through, was very accurate. I really could relate to it um, because it, it, it was just accurate. It was there. They hit on all the right points. Um, but I was I was concerned when I 
to see this movie because like i said i thought it was going to show it in a way that almost made a mockery of it but it was truthful and it was honest which i really loved yeah i i think that there were levels and and layers to this movie that i did not anticipate there being um clearly with the uh the yoko um you know subtle descriptions there Mm -hmm. the cabaret all the little things that i i picked up on that were not obvious. I liked that they. It was well thought out. They yeah. made they made a point to make this a movie um, that really tried to, like you said, give an honest perspective of this story. And realistically, one of the first ones that we've had. You know, I, we mentioned we hadn't think that we'd ever seen a, a movie about the story of someone coming out. And outside of Call Me by Your Name, which is not necessarily the story of somebody coming out, but like discovering about themselves, mm-hmm. um, I don't think we have gotten it. And no. if if it's out there, I I can't think of it off the top of my head. But yeah, I th- I thought it was a good representation um, from you know the, the stories and the the firsthand accounts that I have, you know, both with friends and just anything like that. But um, yeah, I thought I thought it was is a a strong representation that didn't take advantage of its content Mm -hmm. yeah all right so your your final thoughts and then um i don't know ranking one to five i had some options i thought maybe iced coffees um or like gay pride (laughs) pins let's go with iced coffees because they really they really do focus on iced coffees it was was important so your final thoughts of uh love simon and your ranking one out of five one to five uh, five. iced coffees okay so final thoughts i would say this is a movie that I think a lot of people need to see. Um, even if you're if you're not gay, I mean, you need to see it because it gives you a perspective that you don't know. You know, a lot of people say, "Oh, I have gay friends. I have gay friends," but you don't see what they've gone through. Um, and I think this gives you that option, that opportunity to see what they what your friends have gone through. And it just it tells the story in such a way that is so positive and so uplifting and empowering like i said it's just it, it's fantastic and i would give this probably uh, four iced coffees out of five all right yeah excellent yeah i um i'm very close to that i i gave it a three and a half out of five and for me ultimately it's not that the movie wasn't good um it had a very strong message a very positive message um, a lot of funny moments we mm-hmm. were laughing a lot a lot of emotional connections made to characters um i very much appreciated those conversations with the mom, um, the relationship that he had with his sister. Um, you know, all of those moments really made it a strong uh, character attachment. Uh, for me, the predictability of the type of movie that it was, that drew it away from it, mm-hmm. where I, I pretty much knew everything. Like, I was not surprised when Brom walked up. It was like, once they had Brom, Lyle, and Cal all kind of debunked, I was like, it's going to be one of those three. Like, it has to be. There's no one else for it to be other than Nick or Martin. And I was like, Nick has been so into Abby. Yeah. It would make it would make no mm-hmm. sense for him to be it. Um, I, the, the only other one I thought it could have been was the quarterback, that or the guy mm-hmm. that, that um, Abby and him were, were talking about at the game. That was the only other character that I realistically could feel like, oh, that would be blue. So when Brom showed up, I wasn't really surprised, um, which is kind of, kind of ironic that we say like Brom came out and I wasn't surprised about it which kind of is against <laughs> everything that we were talking about doing um, but yeah I, I, I thought it was this really strong movie I, I agree with you thinking that it's a it's a good movie for a lot of people to see um, you take away the kind of cheesy elements that are like you know like the Nicholas Sparks or the you know the um, the fault in our stars that kind of yeah. feeling that you get from these types of movies you take away all that and you look at the message and it, it portrayed it the way it needed to um it was a strong movie it was funny it was um heart you know, it, it pulled at your heartstrings um and it, it didn't really abandon any character development it tied up all the strings everyone had their yeah. story and everybody felt justified in the end with how things went yeah and everybody had a full arc everybody grew you know I just really enjoyed that everybody was involved. It wasn't 100% completely about Simon. It was about the people around him. And it showed what the others went through, too. And it wasn't just about him. Yeah. Which I liked. And then just you know, bringing that idea that you know, when something like this happens, it is a major play on the person coming out. But it does, in reality, impact those around mm-hmm. that person. 
um, and they didn't make light of the situation by focusing so much on the others, nor did they forget about them, and I think that was important. So, um, good movie, definitely uh, would recommend it, um, but I would tell people to lower your expectations about um, the swerves and things like that. It's about the message, reality-wise, yeah. you know. I, I think that's that's where the, the strength of this movie lies. Um, so next week, we'll be looking at either... I, I haven't decided yet, really. i got to go find somebody. I'm going to be starting making phone calls after this. Um, I need to find someone as a guest host, but we're going to be either checking out Isle of Dogs or Pacific Rim Uprising, two very different movies. <laughs> um, one, you know, stop-motion animation, and the other, a sci-fi movie about aliens and large robots kicking each other's asses. Um, two very different ends of the spectrum. But either way, I'll probably end up going and seeing both of them. Um, so we don't have a guest host yet, but that will be uh, coming out next week. Um, until uh, then, if you guys have any thoughts about Love, Simon, you have any stories to share, any perspectives about it, um, you can reach us either through the email at driveineventide at gmail.com, or you can check us out on Twitter at driveineventide. Um, Nick, thank you very much for coming on. This is a very personal story yes. and the connection that you had to it. Um, you know, putting that out there for everybody, you, you've, it's not like you came out on this, but you, you shared stories that you don't share with everybody. And yeah. I appreciate that. And I, I really respect that. It was great to be able for me to be able to kind of, um, look back on those experiences because they were a long time ago. I was 18 when I came out. I'm 31 now. So, you know, looking back of remembering what it was like to be that closeted kid, I had to think about it. I had to remember those feelings. And then seeing those actions happening on, on the screen, was it brought it all back. And I'm I'm a very confident, proud gay man. But to remember what it was like was very enlightening to me. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to come on here, um, not only talk about the movie, but kind of tell my story a little bit. Well, we're going to get you on here again here soon. And we'll make sure that we have a... Another, we had mentioned the uh, life of the party is maybe being the next one that Nick comes on for, and that one was not is not going to get as real. We're just going to talk <laughs> about funny Melissa McCarthy yes. uh, shtick and and what she does. But um, yeah, again, thanks for for coming on. It was a, absolutely one of our longer episodes, and I think uh, hopefully we get a lot of people listening to it. It's really important. This is definitely going to go down as one of the more important episodes that we've we've uh, recorded. It's been so. fantastic. All right, so until next time, everybody. Um, Make sure that you go and check out Love, Simon, um, and let us know what your thoughts are on it. Be very interested interested to see what uh, everybody thought. Uh, until then, though, drive home safe, everybody. We'll see you next time.